Well, welcome to the second episode of the OB1 podcast made possible by Bet Winner, John Obi Mikel, Chelsea and Nigeria legend, alongside myself, Chris McCarty. We've made it through episode one, John. We have. We're we back. Did. We did. We're trending, aren't we? Uh, yeah. Episode one was really good. It was cool. Yeah, it was really good. I mean, you could you couldn't start any better with the you know with the with the big man, the legend, Mister Chelsea, yeah. one and only John Terry. John Terry again, like you said, uh, amazing. Our sponsors, bet winner. You know they're uh, happy. Yeah, they're happy. I mean, all this couldn't have been possible without them. So of course. they're as long, happy as long as they're happy. <laughs> you're happy, which means. I'm happy. They're happy. They, you know, they're part of the family now. Bet winner is, uh, is number one. Is the number one, actually, number one uh, betting company, you know, in, in, in Africa, especially in Nigeria. Um, I think if, you, if you're a betting person and you want to, you know, stick your bet anywhere, pff, there's no Could better bet place. Winner. No. Just bet responsibly. Winning has always been my driving force. Growing up, I dreamt of playing for the Nigeria national team. My passion led me there. The support and unity of players and Nigerian fans led us to the final. Together, we won the African Cup of Nations. The moments that will forever be carved in my heart. Join the winning team with Betwinner. Uh, right, John Terry, you said it, captain, leader, legend. legend yeah. What a way to kickstart this podcast series. But you've delved into that contact book and you've plundered the man who John Terry told us on this podcast yeah. last time out. He's the greatest Chelsea player of all time. That man is... Super Frank. Super <laughs> Frank Lampard. Where do we go? Super, oh, super yeah. Frank, super, super Frank. Super, super Frank, super Frankie Lam. How much did he pay for you to see? <laughs> it's easy to see why you were a footballer and not a musician. Not much. He's got so many goals for us to be able to win all those trophies that, uh, that we won. So, yeah, I think that's what he's paid me. You were at the football club, forgive me, 11 years, 12 years? Yeah, about 11, yeah. 11 years. Yeah, he, he's, yeah, he was there longer than I was, probably... Two, three years more, I think. Yeah, yeah. he yeah. moved to, of course, Man City in yeah. 2014. We'll maybe get Frank's thoughts yeah. on that. But in all your years at the football club, I know you've said on the previous podcast, Ian Hazard, natural ability, best player you probably played yeah. with. Where's Frank Lampard? JT has said he's the greatest Chelsea player of all time. Is he? Do you agree with that? I think so. I think so. I, I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, I think when you look at what he's achieved at the club, um, coming into the club and... Uh, you know, had to prove a lot because, you know, I read a little bit about him, you know, when he came into the club, he came from West Ham, obviously. Um, and there's a lot of people, you know, there's a lot of debate if he could do it at Chelsea. Uh, but fair play to him, mate. I mean, yeah. what a what a great professional he is. Uh, being at the club, watching Frank train every day and watching him play week in, week out. And the way he went about his business as well, you know, his cool, calm, collective Guy doesn't speak much, but gets the job done. And, you know, sometimes that's what you need. You need a cool head. You need a, someone who's cool, calm, collective. And that's what Frank gave us, it's really. It's interesting you said there that he didn't say much. Yeah. What was he like on the pitch on a match day? Was he demanding of you? He was, yeah. Yeah, he was demanding. He will tell you there's lots of times me and him has had a, we've had really? fights. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Verbal? We've had, yeah, verbal fights in the trade. No, 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 no. No, no, we haven't squared up on each other, no. But, who uh, wins a boxing? <laughs> who wins a boxing fight? You or Frank? We both tall. We both big. We both. <laughs> I don't win. know who's gonna win, but <laughs> I think you. He's not here yet. I'll say you. You definitely school Frank in a no, boxing but, fight. No, definitely. We've had few times where you know we've both had fights. You know during the game, um, where he's expected me to raise my 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 level, and same from me as well. I expect him to leave, raise his level or do something or help me out in terms of defensively. Yeah. I know Frank always wants to score goals, which is what we want from him as well, because we can't depend solely on DJ Drug by all the strikers to score goals. Uh, and that's something that Frank give, gave us during those years, you know, he was always chipping in goals. Um, I think he's the highest goal scorer now. Uh, 211 goals for Chelsea. I mean, that is remarkable. That's remarkable for, for a midfield player. Yeah. 
Yeah. What was his best quality? Uh, I mean, myself as a, a journalist, as a football fan, I've got my own kind of views on Frank. You that played with him, what made him so special, honestly? Uh, he was special. He was special. I, I think when I watch him play, every time I was next to him playing in a game or training, it's just the way he conducted himself. Frank is a proper, proper guy. You know, I always say this to, uh, to, to people. Uh, I don't know if it's the word that I use or the word that I, I, but he's a proper guy. You know what I mean? You know, when you say somebody's proper, somebody's proper. He never did a lot of things wrong. He was always early for training. He came in, he trained and he was properly, gone. properly. You know, he, you know, he looked after himself in terms of massage treatment and all that. But uh, one thing you can never get Frank not to do is when he's injured, he wants to come back as quickly as possible. So what happened then was that the physios and doctors are always like, no, Frank, you can't go back. No, no, I want to go back. Just inject, just give me some injections. I want to go back. Like, <laughs> so Frank was somebody that you have to deal with because he wants to play week in, week out. And that's the attitude that he had. He wants to be out on the pitch playing. If we think of your time at Chelsea, a lot of people will mention the Champions League final. That was your that was your game. Yeah, everyone remembers that. Yeah, the, the final against Bayern Munich. Yeah, yeah. When you think of Frank, and I appreciate John, I'm popping you on the spot a little bit here, but when you you personally think back, what was the game where Frank was just you were like, wow, that was special. Is there a Oof. game that stands out every Oof. week? Oh, yeah, every week, every week, pretty much. I think that's the thing about Frank, though. You can never, uh, when I look back at him, there's, there's not many games that you look and you say, Frank has had a bad game, though. No. You know, he, if he's not playing well at that day, he's putting in tackles, he's putting in defensively well, uh, work, or he's chipped in a goal. He's gone into the box and rebound, boom. Frank, who's there? Frank, Frank. is there. Uh, and that's something he did. Uh, sometimes we didn't expect him to play great. But he always, you know, he always comes up with the goods. When it, co when it comes down to goals, assists, or something like that, he's, he was always there for us. And um, no, what a guy. Uh, and obviously, the Champions League final where, obviously, the main man, JT, wasn't there. Uh, and Frank was the captain for the night. You know, he had to lead yeah, the team. Right. And that's something, you know, that I really want to ask him. I wouldn't want to talk about because, you know... Um, what was it like leading the team out, knowing that Mr. Chelsea was not there? Were you thinking about just playing the game or were you thinking about, yeah. you know what? I'm about to make history here because I'm leading this football club out to, you know, to potentially winning the first Champions League of Chelsea. And, and how did that play out? But because obviously I was next to him and I saw how cool collective he was. Uh, even when we went down, one nil down, he was like, come on, guys. He was like, come he on, come calm. on, come on. Yeah, he was calm. He's like, come on, come on, Mikael, come on, let's go. And then obviously the big man, Didier, came, comes up with the, you know, the equalizer and, you know, we, suddenly we're back in the game. But uh, no, Frank was, you know, every time JT wasn't there, he always stepped up. And one of, the, one of the biggest compliments you've given him, and I'm, I'm keen to quiz him on this, is that there was no manager that had a crossword to say about Frank, he got on with how many managers did you have in that spell? 127 <laughs> or whatever it was. And every one of those managers yeah. saw the beauty in Frank, saw his professionalism, yeah. saw his quality. Yeah. Yeah. And he was a mainstay in every yeah. one of those managers' he was. teams. He was. He was a mainstay, exactly the word. Um, and he was always there. Well, listen, here he is now, Frank Lampard, <laughs> right on cue. You've seen his set his standards high. Yep. I've got to tell Frank this because I'll embarrass him straight <laughs> off the bat. We got a message, Frank. Uh, good evening, first and foremost, Frank. We got a message from John this afternoon that said, lads, we got to be ready, bang on 11 o'clock, because Frank is never late. He's never been late for a thing in his life. And right on cue, local time here in Dubai, it's 11 o'clock, and here you are, Frank. Well, you know what, when you've got two kids that are on bath time, it's 7 o'clock here. <laughs> so I've been rushing down. I'm actually four minutes late, so thanks for not mentioning that. <laughs> well, listen, it is great to have you on the OB1 podcast, made possible by Betwinner Frank. Yeah. You've got a great setup. It looks like your own mastermind. What's that? Sorry, I'm a mastermind. It, it, it yeah, looks nice, like yeah. you're a mastermind. <laughs> I know. I do. You know what? We're doing a few bits in the house at the minute. I was trying to find the right moment and the right angle. So I hope we're okay. Is, is the sound all right for you? Yeah, yeah. You're right, yeah, old boy. You're right. Thanks, old boy. <laughs> we'll talk about being an old boy. <laughs> I 
feel like an old boy. How are the kids? How are the kids? Are they all right? They're really good. They're really good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. My, my, my older girls are doing well. They're growing up, but my, my young two are just a handful, but they're all good. All good. Keeping you young, Frank. Well, yeah, I think so. I think so. Listen, Frank, it's great to have you on the podcast. You know, we set the bar high last week with John Terry. We're setting even higher. And the reason that I say that, and I said this to John a little earlier, JT last week said, and I don't want to embarrass you, but that you are the greatest Chelsea player of all time. That's words from JT, John. Yeah, yeah, for yeah. Goodness sake. And I agree us. with that. I agree with that. No, no, yeah, yeah. I do. No, I do agree with that. Like I said, um, obviously, play with you. Uh, for a very long time, the standard that you set, not just during training time, obviously during games, uh, the, the standard was always, always high. And uh, for me, I've always said, you know, you, you were somebody that we looked up to, not just uh, during game time, but training as well, coming in every day and doing the same thing. Uh, even when you know that you needed to improve when it comes to, you know, the shuttle runs that you do every morning or what what is it, shooting, drills or something that you want to do. We all see you do that, but it's just because you want to improve. You know, you yeah. just don't want to be there. You want to improve and get better. And I, I definitely agree with what JT said, really. So I'm bad you, Frank. No, 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 no well, I really appreciate it. Thank you. And... Uh... <laughs> It's, it's hard to, to, to get those sort of compliments because I think with Chelsea, there's so many great players that not only we play with that preceded us as well with, you know, Gianfranco Zola. I crossed over him for a couple of years, but Peter Osgood, the history of the club. So we, we obviously had an amazing era in our time. And I think you can only get the uh, people saying those things about you if you work with great players in a great environment, with great teammates in the, in the right moment. I, I joined Chelsea when... Uh, 2000 was it now early 2000s and we were a team yes. pre with Abramovich that were like probably didn't fighting for top six maybe falling just slightly outside of that so looking back it was a big move for me for jump from West Ham but looking back if I didn't have um, the players around me of course but mainly Roman Abramovich coming in two years after that changing the face of the club then I'm not sure where I would have been as well. So listen, I appreciate it. I did, I did a lot of personal hard work. Everyone's journey will say that, you know, yeah. I would say the same. John would have said the same last week, clearly, but um, we were I, I definitely, and it's, sometimes it's easy when you finish and you, and you pack up because you get a better, a better perspective on everything. Can you realize the things around you that helped you and stuff? And uh, being in Chelsea in those 13 years I did there were like amazing times for us. I remember catching up with your uncle, former boss of yours as well, Harry Redknapp, Frank. He's a regular visitor to this part of the world and he was so full of praise for you. You know, I've had him on my radio show and, and I spoke about the great players that he's managed and the great trainers. And without missing a beat, he said, our Frank, I've never met a trainer like it. He would do all the extras. It would be raining, it would be sleet. There was once I had to call a security guard because I thought someone <laughs> had leaped over the fence at West Ham. Frank was always willing to go above and beyond to put the work in. Where did that work ethic come from, Frank? Cool. It's like, it's like um, I don't know whether, whether it's fate or whether it's the makeup of, of myself or my life. I had uh, a dad who was a player, uh, quite a hard taskmaster I used to push me as a kid so I was a I was a kid that loved football but before, at four or five years of age when I started kicking a ball my dad would kind of probably fast track me in a sense and help me lows in the in the sense that he was like driving me and driving me and if you don't train hard you won't get over your your weaknesses or you know me I was a quite a chubby kid you know I was midfield I was kind of a decent player and all these things but he used to drive me to sort of say that. So it became like an obsession within myself that was probably pushed by my dad and I took hold of myself. So I took that through my career. So like, I know a lot of people talk about me and they talk about kind of work ethic and stuff. And I wasn't an angel. I'm sure I'll be able to tell you some things <laughs> in a couple of hours. I've got a funny story <laughs> now. I was going to say, I'm going to talk no, wait, about wait, it in a minute. Wait for that. I don't, I don't want to be an angel. It's good to have like, you know, you don't have to be an angel in a way. But when it came to work, I found my way of of working i enjoyed uh training i enjoyed running i enjoyed trying to be better i had this kind of inside uh, makeup that i wanted to be best i could be i wanted to be better than the other people around me i remember when i grew up my dad always used to call it professional jealousy and it was basically a striving to be better than the one next year or the competitor yep. down the yep. road or whatever yep. it would be. and i have to say Obi, i actually was thinking before coming on there that i actually sensed a bit of that in you because you were not like um 
what, what, what does that in terms of personality? I always sense from you because you came in as a young boy. Yeah. Yeah. But there was something about you that if you were a young boy that didn't have that about you at Chelsea, you could get pushed to the side. And mm-hmm. I always felt that about you. There was something about you that was like, no, I want to play in front of Frank or whoever or whoever. Like you had a belief, and but yeah. also, yeah, yeah. No, I yeah. certainly had that. Thanks for that. In my head. No, no, but it's, but it's, it's true. And you see it in top players. You look back and reflect on their careers and you look at them. And, and unless you're these individual crazy talents, maybe that are, have a different makeup and some make it to as much as they could have done or they don't quite strive to levels. I definitely packed up thinking all those work ethic things that I did along the way were obviously part of what I became. So I, I, I appreciate that I was given that as a youngster, but I, I definitely took it probably all the way until I finished. You know, I was a, a compulsive trainer uh, to try and be better. And whatever the reasons were, whether it was wanting to be better than the man next to me, my competitor, whatever, from my own head, I had that in me, so I was sort of fortunate to have that. He says he's no angel, John. He's yeah. given you carte blanche to tell us <laughs> a story. <laughs> he said, go on, John. He doesn't want to be known yeah. as an angel. <laughs> Come on, then. No, obviously, I mean, the story he knows about it, obviously. You know, when you, uh, when is the week? Oh, it doesn't happen often. But when you, when is the summer in London, which doesn't happen often? <laughs> the sunshine. And then there's a massive, there's a sunshine and it's sunny and it's hot. And then you see, and then, and then we're all coming out to train and everybody's is coming out with sleeveless and t-shirt. And then you see Frank coming out with a, with, you know, with a rain jacket, <laughs> you know. <laughs> that means he's had a night out or what? Does that what it mean, Frank? <laughs> that means, that means he's had a night out. <laughs> Can't he believe you know that. This, he needs I, I didn't to realize that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I tell you, I tell you the story behind that, right? I, when I when I was young, I, um, yeah. my dad had played for West Ham, so he played with the great Bobby Moore, who I grew up on stories of Bobby Moore. So my dad's story on Bobby Moore that was like it was really old school, you know, different eras in the modern day. This doesn't happen. Um, yeah. you know, when, Bobby Moore would play a game, go out on a Saturday, then they'll come in and train at the stadium the next day. And Bobby Moore would put on like five layers <laughs> and just jog around the pitch. Yeah. So, I remember that. so when I so as I grew up, my dad, when we used to go running around the streets where I lived in the suburbs, it was like we go and he'd go like, put so I used to wear a black bin bag to, to run. So I'd have to cut it, get it out of my mum's drawer, cut it open, put my head through, put my arms, through, wear that, layer it up. <laughs> And get a sweat up, and this is I'm 14. It's ridiculous, really. Yeah, but it, was, it was always in my head um, as a as a kid growing up. So, uh, Obi's right. He's not. He's not like <laughs> obviously he saw it. I, I went up, if I would have if I'd have gone out after a game and we're in for a Sunday morning warm down, I would have gone in, done the 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 the, the post match kind of warm down thing that we do, and I would have probably gone and done a few laps around the back of Cobham. Yeah, probably more yeah. Than my own head and just to clean. Yeah, but that sounds like I was like a, a crazy party boy. I would have worn. I, it became me a little bit, and I would have worn a wet top loads in training. I like to sweat, you know. I still yeah, do. You was, yeah, you was always wearing it though. You was always yeah. wearing it. Yeah, yeah, no, it's yeah, true. Yeah. It's true, and it, and it was all. It's quite for, it's quite forgiving. So if you carry yeah. a little pre-season, you can put on a wet <laughs> top. You got a bit of space, and you can lose a couple of kilos that you put on over the last month. But no, it was in in seriousness. It was again. It was part of my kind of mindset. I had this crazy mindset that. Um, those sweating and working in training and those things you kind of get rewards from them so i i did i did do that the occasional night out but i also did that for a, a mindset thing <laughs> and, it, and it certainly worked frank you know we were just talking before you arrived on this call tonight and the standards you set you know john obi said in training you know, as an observer frank you were a bit like and this is a funny comparison i'm a big united fan they always used to say about Dennis Irwin, you wouldn't get less than seven and a half out of Dennis Irwin week in, week out. I think at Chelsea, you were very rarely below an eight in terms of your performances. What do you put that down to? You know, your performance levels, week in, week out, Frank. You didn't have a bad game, seemingly. Uh, no, 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 listen, I did. I, I see what you're getting at. I did have, I did have certain, plenty of bad games, particularly in my own head, because I would have been my own worst critic, which I think is a good thing as a player. You have to have a, a, a stable understanding of yourself to try and get better. So, but I did, um, I don't know, again, I, I think I probably worked my way up. I came to Chelsea as a, a pretty young kid. Uh, I was surrounded straight away by people that I looked up to in Gianfranco Zola, um, Marcel Desai, World Cup yeah, winners, yeah, etc. Yeah. And, and, even, and even that, even that, the, the John Terry's and the Ida Good Johnson's and the Jody Morris at the time, they were better at a lot of things that I actually thought I was okay at. They were like hitting balls at the left foot. And I was a bit embarrassed at 
first. I was like, they can hit the ball to their left foot like 60 yards. Like, ping, JT did it throughout his career. Yeah. And I could yeah. do that. So I was always striving, like, well, I see that in training. So I want to replicate that because I want to be able to do that in a game. So many things I would just like push my game on as I saw it. It has the only way to affect what you do on a Saturday is to do what you do through the week and try and improve. So I probably worked on that again I had really good players around me as my career went on uh, and, and I, I can probably when you pack up as well you can probably take a bit of credit and go and actually you know I was a decent player I was a player that worked and trained had good surroundings around me and managed to get to myself to a level where I, I could get a good level of consistency and I, I had pride in that you know and I tried to try and be um, a good um, influence have good influence in all the games I played and as you say like I didn't have I did have bad games, but I think probably when I, when you're a player that can put in work ethic and be kind of, you know, do all the right, try and do the right things, you can probably get away with certain games because you've got surrounded by good players around you that help you in those moments when you need them. But also I found a way as I went through my career to, to, to raise my level. And it probably happened when I was about 25 or so, probably in, a little bit in conjunction with Jose, but probably just before that at Ranieri where I brought goals into my game and assists and that kind of stuff. Yep. which took me to a different level, which I, I then sort of got a bit of an understanding of, well, I want to get even better than that. And I kind of got on a train. So there were loads, loads of little di different stepping stones. And you can look back and go, yeah, you, you had seven or eight out of 10 throughout your career. I didn't. I had fours and fives, you know, like and things like that. But on a consistent level, you know, I did okay, I suppose. <laughs> but those fours didn't happen too often. No, now. they did not. <laughs> no. They were like maybe one or two or three. Two during the season. <laughs> no, mate, maybe. I mean, like, yeah, that, that, yeah. That's, so, that's so normal, you know, like, and you have to be mature as you get a player. You have to understand it and, and understand you can't be your best all the time. But what you can do is give give your best and try and be the right, you know, as good as you can be all the time. And as, as you say, as much as I would be the first one to go and have a beer after a win, I'll be the one yeah, yeah, yeah. to leave. But I knew yeah. that it would be, okay, well, get yourself in order, have a structure, know what you need to do to get yourself in the best position to play games and you know that kind of it, it just it worked for me and you know some of my values are really old school probably promoted by my dad which I think are good things you have to hold on to those things that will always matter as long as football is around yeah, the old yeah. things about doing the right things and some of the things I just found that they sort of came as my career went on and you get more confident and you build and you you manage to give yourself a, a feeling of like you go into a game not not feeling invincible that would sound too like big-headed but we had a period at Chelsea and I had a fair period where you go, yeah, I, I do back myself, you know, and I back my teammate. And yeah, you know, that's why that period for Chelsea was so um, special because it wasn't me, it would be Didier, it would be John. Yeah, be, yeah, be, yeah, yeah. Be Cole, yeah. The obvious players developed around you, you know, that we, we had this amazing thing. We've had a lot of banter, uh, John Obi and I, uh, about the fact that he was uh, the second son of Hoose Head Inc. Uh, John and, and Hoose were, 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 were kindred spirits. Uh, I wonder I with that. you, Frank. <laughs> you see, you remember that? <laughs> you definitely I remember, remember that. that. I remember that. He always starts saying, he always says, Goose is my dad. <laughs> right, so you start to that, Frank. It. Frank always starts saying... <laughs> But I'd be smart, see, he knew like sometimes as a manager you've got to work them on early, get in early and then they start to crush you and then you get you know. So uh, with that in mind, who do you feel, not necessarily the manager that, that brought the trophies and I think we all know where I'd go with that, who did you feel, Frank, that you improved under the most? What, what was, who was the manager that, that got the best out of Frank Lampard? Well, it, well, it was definitely uh, Jose Mourinho and the reason being that I was probably 25-ish or something. So I was very in a sweet spot of a good age, impressionable. And he came and brought something really fresh to the club as a whole. I won't be the only player to say this. He brought this kind of self-confidence in how he, he brought himself in, how he spoke. Um, I wouldn't say he, he's obviously very good tactically and was at the time. But for me personally, he basically set up a system and a structure of a team that really suited me. So there wasn't much detail that I needed beyond that. He would have given me detail, but there wasn't much more than that. So the main thing that he gave me was a mindset and a confidence to step further than probably what I thought I could have done before. I was I was a pretty <laughs> humble kid. You know, I was like at Chelsea, you know, this is great. You know, I didn't I didn't have aspirations to try and well, I did have aspirations, but I, I didn't maybe need necessarily leave that I could go to the levels of Champions League and all these things yeah, playing for yeah. the country. And Jose kind of walked in as if to sort of say, well, you should have, you know what I mean? And he kind of, that definitely rubbed off on me. So definitely in that first three-year period, 
he's t- certainly the one that took my career from like being going well to a different level. And I felt, I, I literally felt it. And it's, it's an interesting thing when you become a manager because you understand the things that are not tactical, that are just personal, that make you a, a better player or a better mindset or, you know, whatever. Some players need the stick. Some players need a cuddle. Mm-hmm. I didn't probably, I probably needed neither. I needed just to be sort of supported and left alone to work. Mm-hmm. And Joe they probably gave me that um, in my career. And it's always a tough one because you get asked about all the managers. And because we had so many, you almost got to go, I don't want to leave anyone out. There's some you yeah. do want to leave out. Yeah. <laughs> there's, a lot that you, yeah. there's a lot you don't. You know, like Ranieri brought me to Chelsea. Thanks. I really appreciate it. It was great for me. That changed my life. Jose made that big step for me. That along the way there, uh, Gus, Gus, I love Gus as well because yeah. he had this really sort of, I don't, I don't even know what he did. It just made everything great. Do you know what I mean? It made the environment yeah. great. Easy yeah. information, but Carlo Ancelotti was was a genius in in being like a father figure and a, and a and a manager who would just kind of like be be make you feel really comfortable. So lots of managers mm-hmm. in their own ways have ways of sort of helping you sort of step through your career, I guess. Speaking candidly, and I'll, I'll ask you both this, uh, yeah. and I know, listen, you're, you're too respectful, both of you, of the men that you worked under, but I think you can give me an honest answer with this question. Was there a manager, and I know we touched on Rafa, and we had a bit of f- fun with Rafa last week, but was there a manager that arrived, maybe with a big reputation, where you thought, oh, this is going to be good, and perhaps it just missed the mark? Maybe for whatever reason you thought, nah, we didn't maybe see the best of them. You know, I think Luis Felipe Scolari is one yeah, that springs yeah. to mind. Andre Villas Boas, I remember, came with a big reputation. Was there one, Frank, and, and I know, listen, you're a hugely respectful guy, but maybe it just missed the mark. Well, I think I can probably speak differently now from, from managing for like the last four years because when you're in your mid twenties or your low thirties, I think you you only you see things through a slightly not selfish lens, but like a younger lens. And you're you're kind of worried about yourself. Am I going to play every week? You know, what's going to be the best for me? And I I was probably quite lucky that I didn't have any problem at Chelsea. I played very regularly for a long period of time. And even in the Scolari days, like I I was a fan of Scolari as a as a man. He, He I found him, you know, quite a warm, sort of comforting coach. He set up his system. It didn't work yeah. in the end. I, I I enjoyed playing for him, so I couldn't. I certainly couldn't speak badly of him. Yeah, he was good, wasn't he? Like, I mean, he was good in terms of map management as well. Yeah, and he didn't really speak the language that well. Yeah, so yeah it exactly. Yeah. It was all about kind of you know like almost actions and motions and how he yeah. was. <laughs> it was though, and I, I just kind of got the feeling that he was a nice bloke, and that, that, there's something to be said for that, obviously. But then I suppose Andre Villas Boas is the one that actually took me out of the team, and he took me out of the team. I mean, I was 33 at that point. And I'd never had that. So my reaction to that was a bit kind of, this is kind of how I am sometimes. And it's probably a bit of a fault of mine as a, as a player. You try to improve all the time as you get a bit older. But when he took me out of the team, my reaction was kind of like to like, um, well, first, it wasn't nothing to do with training, but it was almost like to kind of like go, well, um, F you then. Like, if you're going to do that to me, I'm not going to give you the warmth back kind of thing. And, yeah, I, and, I, probably yeah. did that and, I, and I regret it because... I'm a coach. If I, I see those things happen with me, you know, and a coach yeah. play, play and they all have different reactions, you have to understand it. And so I, I think we probably didn't, um, well, we certainly didn't work in terms of a personal aspect in, in his period at the time. And I think he was probably looking back, trying to come in uh, as, a, as a young manager. He was younger than me. At he was young, time. yeah. Uh, yeah, he was young, yeah. Say, he was slightly younger than me. And that, that, that you know, I, I didn't really think about it in that way. So when you look back, you kind of go, that's a young manager coming at Chelsea with all the pressures of it. And I think he tried to make an impact um, in a certain way. He tried to shake it up. Maybe he'd been given direction from above to shake it up because some yeah, of us yeah. are a bit older. And that, I, I know that was the case. Um, so it didn't quite work in that period. But I certainly wouldn't, um, you know, be too negative about manager because they all had their ways. And Andre went on to have different successes. And, you know, you, you obviously wish people well. And as a coach, I understand now even more that if you don't align the timing and the squad and the coach and the owner and the sporting director and all these things, they're not quite right in that moment, whatever it might be, it may not work, you know what I mean, on a bigger picture. So I think all the managers, Chelsea are always going to get high caliber managers. Um, but for me, that, that was the one that kind of didn't work. And as I say, I reflect on it and I have little things where I go, I could have done better. I think he probably could have done better with me. That's for him to say. Um, but on a personal level, that was the one. I, that I didn't really, at Chelsea, it was just all different experiences of, of managers. Some are more warm, some are less warm. They don't want to talk to you. They'll tell you you're playing or you're not playing. They don't speak to you. Others put their arm around you. 
I didn't need much. I was quite low maintenance. I can say that for sure. I didn't. <laughs> I didn't no, I, I for my manager. No, yeah, I, yeah. <laughs> I didn't knock. On, I didn't go knocking on the door. No, yeah, no. no. The authorities, I didn't want to knock on the door. I just yeah, wanted definitely. To yeah, play, yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah. It's interesting that because modern day footballers, Frank, certainly, the, and, and listen, you've been a manager now and we'll get to your management career in a moment, but you know, I listened to you there saying you weren't one for knocking on the doors. You certainly, I don't think, were leaking stories to the press. You look at today, a young player, a player at your age established, there'll be all kind of rumblings and noises coming out. I mean, you know, how do you kind of, I guess, compare what you kind of went through with the younger player of today and, and how, because we talked about it, didn't we, John yeah, Obi? Yeah. Younger players seemingly now with their agents, there's far more noise around decisions, whether it be dropping a player, you know, or, or a player perhaps just losing his way. What do you make of that and how difficult is that to manage? Well, I think management is becoming more challenging by the year. Um, as as the years go on, and, and a lot of that is probably because they had a ball to move in. I think you know, in terms of agents, in terms of social media pressures, things that are important to the to the the, the younger players nowadays. So I think you have to be very aware of that. And I think in in it's becoming, as I say, harder to manage in that point. I think we were probably fortunate, and this is probably the one of the bits of going and managing in different clubs. Even when I left Chelsea, went to Man City for a year, to New York for eighteen months. We had such a strong dressing room at Chelsea that even though we changed a lot, the dressing rooms kind of found a way. And I think that's quite abnormal. That's quite unique. That's not really the norm. We were so strong in terms of our personalities. And we had some downtimes. I think we should have won more, actually. We should have been more consistently winning in our time. Do we you honestly? Yeah. You think you should I, have I won more? I, we should have won more Premier Leagues, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think people always look back on the, the our era, um, and say, you know, what success or it was, and the fact that changing managers brought success, and, and it's clear that in one ways it did. You know, Di Matteo comes in halfway through the season, we win the Champions League. Benitez comes in, we win the, the champion, uh, the Europa League. Europa League, yeah. But, but at the same time, I do, I do believe that the uh, the to, if we'd have stri strove more for like a bit more of a consistency of sticking with, like when Jose left the club or with Carlo left the club, that these quick. Changes. I think our dressing room was strong. That kept it going. But maybe we could have won more. And I think that's a, it's a, it, that's a slight. I say it's a shame. I think we should all be very content that we were part of a great era that won. And, that, and now I think when you see now so many managers turning over in the Premier League, like it's thirteen managers, six interim managers, of which I was one of, obviously last year. It shows you now that the hunger for success right now, like to 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 win instantly, yeah. no matter what, to stay up in the league, to win the league, to get into the Europe, or whatever it is. It's so intense that it's it's changed the landscape that you better have success right now, uh, and the, and the type of players have changed. So there are a lot of things, and as a manager, you have to kind of not be the person that bemoans everything. You have to move with the times. You have to understand that that's just what it is, um, and and that's what it is. So, but I, as I say, I feel very very fortunate that we we were. And I, I'm sure you're the same. Like things in reflection are always so much better, aren't they? Like when I was playing. I was always worried about the next thing, like dro getting dropped or not winning this or not winning that. Yeah, yeah. Get to 45, I look back and I go, uh, how lucky were we to have, <laughs> made, have fun, like win things, you know what I mean? Like it was, yeah. it was an amazing period of time. Yeah. No, no, no. No, we actually did. We know we did win a lot, didn't we? Uh, I, th I think when when you've just said that now, I think it, it just rings in my mind. If we, had, if we had that consistency of a manager, definitely I, I think we would have won more. Uh, definitely would have won more. But then who would have been? Was it Mourinho or what is yeah. it? Yeah. I think it probably would have been Mourinho or Carlo. Obviously, like you've said, Carlo for me was was a manager that we all respected, didn't we? Um, yeah. His training method was really good. Uh, he was a very good man management uh, when it comes to talking to the players and trying to get the best out of the players. He was, for me, the best, you know? And um, and Mourinho was obviously a tactician. Um, and we, we've always said that the first son, the first son of Mourinho is Frank Lampard, isn't it? <laughs> Did you ever? <laughs> Frank will never do wrong when it comes to Mourinho. <laughs> well, you know what? I was, a, I was a great, you know, I was a great pupil. I was there. I was, but, yeah. <laughs> you know what? No, no, I, I think you, you might be right there. I, I, Jose, Jose never really... Jose never, well, I say never told me. There's a couple of moments I remember in my career where he probably would have said something. One was when it, I, I can't remember what mark he gave me, but I think, I don't know if you were playing, I'd be at Reading at half time and he came in and he gave everyone a mark out of 10. 
at half time, and it was like, oh, no, I don't remember that. No. Four, six, <laughs> five, four. We were one nil down, the and he's probably giving me like a four or five, which I'm like, I deserve this so. I remember that. And then the other one was that he he had a gun, like a, a, a kind of like a wide free kick or a deep free kick, right shot, yeah. shot lost. And I remember him pulling me the next day and going, and he was not angry with me, but he gave me the little jab, you know. Yeah. And, other than that, with Jose, but, and uh, you know, I think we probably worked for each other. Like, I think I was, as I say, pretty low on maintenance, and I was in good nick. I was, that period for me was a good period. Yeah, yeah. changed the face of the club. But it's, it's yes. interesting when you talk about um, Carlo Ancelotti there, because I think when you talk about him, I, I think when Carlo came to the club, I sensed this because I lived through that uh, period of uh, the early periods of him with with Jose in those periods until until Carlo came. I sensed mm. the change of um structure at the club when Carlo came. And I, I sensed like a stability about the club in the early days. We had Peter Kenyon was in, in the early days with Jose yeah. Mourinho. So it felt like a real structure of the club. We had this amazing owner, you know, the, 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 the finances are there to bring in players. We've got a football in plan, the vision. We mm -hmm. all try to manage him where he's going. And then that kind of got obviously when Jose leaves gets a little bit of a shake. And we carried on getting some results. We got to the obviously the, the Champions League final with Avram Grant. Um, sometimes I forget the, the chronologically of it of, of the order, but I know that when Carlo came in, I felt like there was a little bit more instability about the people up and around the manager. And I don't think Carlo maybe felt necessarily always in the second season the support of of a manager at Chelsea, where you get that kind of like, okay, we're going to have a tough time, wherever it might be. Inter Milan knock us out of the of the Champions League. Champions or, League, yeah. Second season when we come second or whatever, you know, like oh, we won the FA Cup and he got the, you know, like those yeah. things. The stability of the club for me had changed, and I, and I think as we see now with Manchester City and these Liverpool and now Arsenal, you see like this kind of structure where you go kind of owner, sporting director, yeah. manager, you know, support, tough yeah. moment. Okay, keep going. What's the idea? What we're we recruiting for and those things. And I think we were in a little bit of a tough moment there. So maybe if Carlo had came in a different period, slightly before or something, and Carlo's shown his his stuff over his years as management, I don't have to talk about for him. But I, I think in his moment, I agree that he could have been one that could have been like a five yeah. or seven year yeah. man. Yeah. I, I yeah. must say, I find it fascinating, you boys, because for so long, Chelsea were held up as this kind of, you know, poster team, if you will, of know consistency and you know continuity doesn't necessarily lead to success look at Chelsea they're always in a state of flux and yet still winning and, and I've just kind of thought there uh, forgive me if I'm wrong on this the exit of Jose Mourinho what was it the start of his third season Avram Grant then took charge and of course you got to the Champions League final yeah. what's the story what was the dressing room like when news filtered through that Jose who you both have said you absolutely loved when he left, what was the, the? Oh, before he was leaving, though. Yeah, but, the, the, but there was a story before he was leaving. I mean, there was there was there was some there was one person who was absolutely in tears the first time Jose Mourinho <laughs> <laughs> goes. <laughs> Frankie, Frankie in tears. The, the, in the old boy, the old boy was absolutely in tears. I remember that. <laughs> I, I, I can't. You know what? The, 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 but the, he was also in tears as well, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah, he was. Yeah, he tears. was, and I, yeah. and I wasn't the only one that felt like I know because I remember yeah. when he and hugged in the dressing room. I used to sit next to John and John. Yeah, you know, way around yeah. the hug went. We were yeah. both quite emotional, but yeah. that was obviously the um, the smartness of of Jose as a coach and and also the natural instincts that he has that he he got us on board on an emotional level as well as a playing level. But I think we're but at that point to go back to the question is that we'd been in this incredible journey of Jose. It was like two two years where we won the league at a canter, pretty much. We won it really well for two years. The third year was more tough, I think, and we win the league and we won the FA Cup, did we, when Didier scored. Uh, mm. And then the third, it started the third year was when it broke down. But by then, it, it became toxic pretty quickly because I think there had been a few uh, new players that had come in. There were some wranglings about Jose not agreeing with the players that came in and there was sort of a bit of negativity a bit that started to seep in. So it wasn't like a complete surprise it was almost like it happened pretty quickly at the start of that season but as a player person on an individual level I was I say devastated I was really disappointed at the time um but as I say like now again when you become much longer in the tooth and older you look back and you just understand the cycle of football you know as a player you kind of go oh, I was disappointed I'm, I, I like I hold on to that it meant I really got on well with Jose he really relied on me 
then it's the next thing as a player. The club's always bigger than all, all of us, the manager and the player. But there was a massive level of disappointment between most of the squad, not all of the squad. Some players would have probably been, you know, not happy that Jose left, but you, you're managing 22, yeah. 23 players. You're not picking five, six, seven, eight of those regularly yeah. at all. Yeah, yeah. You know, they might go, here's my opportunity. Here's the next one. So for some of us, a lot of us, it had been an amazing period and we were disappointed, but the, the club does move on. Uh, I've got to ask this question. I'll, I'll pose it to you, John Obi and, and Frank. Love to get your thoughts on it as well. Uh, and I don't want to be disrespectful to Avram Grant, who steps into the breach after Josie, but how much does Avram take you guys to the Champions League final? Or how much is that the siege mentality that's inbuilt in that football club that takes you through to that final? Because in the face of it, Josie yeah. sacked, what, in the September? First game under Avram's at Old Trafford against Man United. Yeah. Fast forward, you're playing Man United in the Champions League final in yeah, May. I think I got sent off in that game, didn't I? Patrick Severa. Yeah, yeah, I did get was sent off in that game, yeah. I think it was. <laughs> yeah, I think I got our strip work after that game. Yeah, but obviously, right. I mean, yeah, I think, obviously, when you look back, like like Frank has said, uh, I think that, that, you know, the core of the team is always there. You know, we build this togetherness. It's always been there. It doesn't matter what manager comes in or what manager get, gets sacked. The core of the team has always remained, and we've always done things proper. We've always set that standard, yeah. and that standard always remained. We it doesn't matter who's there. We as players know what it meant to represent the club. We've always set that standard, and we always we always do it. Um, and that standard has been set by obviously it starts from 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 JT Frank Didier Peter Czech, Ashley Cole, then it boils down to to, to whoever is there, me, SEN, uh, the rest of us. But the, the truth of it, of it is that we know what we want. We know what the club wants. We have to win games. We have to win trophies, and that's just what it is. And Avram, of of course, when he took over. Uh, very different from Jersey. very differently, obviously. But the but the senior players have to step step in as well to help, and that's where the Franks and the JTs and the DDS they come in, and you know they have to speak to the younger players to make sure that we all on board of what we need to achieve. And uh, I think that's what spared us on to us, you know, getting to that Champions League final as well. Yeah, I, I think I think to give Avram credit. Because at the time, it was such a big move to take this manager that's like, you know, at the top of his game in Europe as such, you know, what he's done at Chelsea, at Porto before, and, and get rid of him and bring in someone that nobody really knows of, you know, like, and it was like that, who'd been moved into a role behind the scenes. But to give Avram credit, I think, and uh, he's a smart man, and what Avram did do was that he kind of let it run, he let the squad run, you know, like he was kind of like had this kind of dip different approach where it was like not so heavily tactical is what we do but every morning we'd go on the pitch we'd have these sort of chats sometimes we'd tell a story about something random you know a random Michael idea. Jordan yeah like Michael Jordan <laughs> like Michael Jordan or he'd tell you a story about this man that fell out of a building <laughs> you know I remember him saying stuff like about the building's on fire how does the man get out this time, I remember sitting at a time going oh, that, how does this relate you know what I mean? But, but you know what? At the time, when I look back on it again, like this is, again, you kind of go, you have to give the man credit for what, for, for being a very savvy man, very smart man, I think, in, in his way. Came into that role with a lot of people kind of going, and I remember it. I, he said to me afterwards at one point, he said to me, You gave me those funny eyes for the first two or three weeks. <laughs> and I was doing my, my salt because my dad had left, as Obi said. You know, my dad left for like two or three weeks. I'm a bit like sulky because Jose's left. And to have him looking back, he kind of let me let me sulk, you know, like you do with my two. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm like, well, you sulk for a minute and you'll come back to me. Yeah, you come back to me, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so uh, he, he did that. And he probably did his version of that in different ways of a lot of the squad. And we were like a, a, a kick away from winning the Champions League. So he deserves a lot of credit for that. I'm always intrigued in the, in the psyche of you boys. You know, you guys have played the game at the elite level. And Frank, it's probably a question you've had more than any other question in your career, you might know where I'm going with this. West Ham Fan Forum 1996. You're sat up at the top table with your boss, the gaffer, your uncle, Harry Redknapp, and an irate fan speaks out, not happy that you at the age of 18 have been given an opportunity. I think it's Scott Canham, isn't it? That he's, he's disappointed that the club have sold Scott. He's gone on to Brentford, I think it is. Uh, there you are at the top table. He's like, you know, it's my opinion, Harry, that that young boy there is not ready to play for West Ham. Uh, and Harry, give him his credit, very calm, says, that's your opinion, my opinion, he is. And he still chip, chippers back. You know the story, Frank. And Harry says, enough. 
I wasn't going to tell this young boy this, but this fella, uh, you were on his right, this young boy is going to go to the very top of the game. That was 1996. Now, be honest with us here. And I've watched it. I watched it today. And there you are. You're a bit embarrassed. You're gulping. You're, you know, your your mouth's dry. What's going through your mind at that point, Frank? Are you embarrassed with the, with the, the room that's there? Are you elated that Harry's sticking up for you? Where does an 18-year-old Frank Lampard's mind go in that moment? Yeah, I, I, had, I had no elation about what Harry said. That came after, like, respect for what he said. At the time, I was sort of embarrassed, um, like devastated as a kid, you know, like I was a young kid. And this fella was an ignorant fella. I, I can say it because he was. He didn't want to give me a chance. He was the uncle of Scott Cannon. And nothing against Scott Cannon. Maybe something against his uncle. But, you know, like, he, 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 he stood up and wanted to have a pop at me. Um, in public, which I just thought was weak, but I didn't. I didn't at that point. I didn't take that in. I was just sitting there going, "Oh my god!" Like it's almost like the room. I was the only man in the room. Like getting, you know, like it was like so nerve wracking for me. Yeah. Uh, and I remember driving home from it. It was the biggest thing because, as I say, Harry's words are amazing. I'll come back to that. But like they're amazing. Peter's story was the sporting director at the time, and he again was supportive. But Harry's words were incredible. Uh, but I remember driving home, and I was in a version of tears. I remember like literal tears, but like complete as a kid um of like this random man like trying to sort of put me in my place and I'm like what what I, I'm just trying to make it as a player I'm just trying to make it as a kid you know I might not yeah. be and I wasn't, I wasn't the bear I'm just trying to get my foot in the first team do as well as like, I was a West Ham fan and get in the team so it was it was a big moment but it was like one of those, that was quite my period at show at West Ham there was a bit like that I had a lot of people that were kind of like wanting to question why I played, why my, my dad was the coach, my uncle was the manager. And I get that. In simple terms, I get it. You know, people just look at the facts and kind of go, oh, he must be getting a leg up. Um, and it, and it, was, it wasn't true, but I had to prove it not to be true. And it wasn't an instant thing. It, it's definitely toughened me up. You know, like a lot of people have asked me that question and showed me the clip and those things. It's just part of my makeup and part of the, the story. And, and I, it sounds a bit soppy to say I'm thankful for it now, but like I had to go through that. And I became very tough for it. And you're going to have it as a player in all senses. Obi would have had it at Chelsea, playing for yeah, my yeah. people are questioning you, you're not good enough, yeah. you should be this, whatever. Yeah, yeah. But, so that was just like the early version of that for me. On the Harry side, you know, thanks very much. Harry went above and beyond what he could have and probably should have said at the time. It was far from me going right to the very top, far from it. You know, that, those things sort of happened after for me. Luckily, in my career, I had a good career at the time. I think Harry was probably being more of a family man my uncle respecting and defending me and i appreciate that more than whether i'd have gone to the rep or not he was basically going now nah, sit down you you know but that's, that's, <laughs> that's football fans sometimes yeah. yeah and i knew john you know as frank's right you'll always find a naysayer you'll always find a critic mm -hmm. you will always find someone yeah. who's jealous looking to put you in your place yeah. how did you deal with that oh, of course no no i did i did just like frank has just said i think my early days at chelsea i had that didn't i um I had where the fans didn't think, oh, is he, is he really up to the scratch? Is he really up to the standard of where Chelsea is? Um, you know, I did, I, you know, I did have that. Um, and you had self-confidence. Of course, the fans did question me. I, I mean, and fair play to them, though. I, I think my early days at the club, I didn't really perform to the standard of where the club should be. And I think the, 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 the older I got, the, the, the more I, I settled in, the more I started to understand how you know, things worked at the club. Obviously, the club is, you know, it's a strange place. You know, you, you, you need to find your place and you need to be accepted, did you? You need to be, you, you need to become one of us before you yeah. start, to, those performance starts to come. And that's something that, but for me, it took a little bit of time. I thought it was going to be happen as quickly as possible, but it didn't. It took me a bit of time uh, to, 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 to be able to get there. But um, I finally, did, I finally did get there, and obviously we started uh, performing well and winning games, and then obviously the Champions League finals. I, I think for me, probably my best game at the yeah. club, uh, whereby you know we had to win it because if we didn't win it, there's no other chance for us to 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 to, to be able to win it. And and that night was special. Obviously, you were the captain that night, and I was always going to ask, what do you think? How did you feel leading leading us out that night? knowing that JT was not there and, and the sole responsibility was on you to lead the team out and you were about to make history as well. 
knowing that if we win this trophy, you were the captain that night. And how did you feel? Was he playing in your mind or were you just thinking about the game? I, th I think more thinking about the game. I, I think that's how I was. Like it really, I was fortunate at Chelsea in terms of JT's role because I, I got there. JT was already like the, the Chelsea kid that had come through with a load of personality and a load of quality. And he was a captain and he had captain written all over him in every way, you know, in terms yeah. of how he played. He's like, you know, an incredible yeah. player, we all know. And he dealt with people and would have been much more active than me to talk to people. And the armband, and he wore it with real pride. You know that. Yeah, but he took I his mom with him, didn't he? He slept with it, <laughs> didn't he? <laughs> Breakfast, lunch with him. <laughs> but you know what? We all knew that. And that's and that's that's what takes to be a great captain. It suited me. The, the vice captain role suited me because it didn't mean I didn't have to go to places I'll be uncomfortable. Um, my thing was probably standards of how I trained, worried about myself. Could I could yeah, I be an example yeah. and all those things? And it just suited me. So in terms of that final, like to, to be the captain was like, it, I, I didn't say, oh, I'm gonna cap I've got the armband, I'm gonna lift it, you know, potentially. I, I didn't expect us to win that game. I'm a realist. I looked at yeah, that game yeah. at Bayern Munich. I didn't go there yeah. and go, here we go, lads, we're gonna now this is our time. I was going again. These boys are on fire, they're at home. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Players out, da, da, da. You know, those things are real. So Firstly, I would have loved John to have been playing, you know, because we know how much you would have needed him. Yeah. Uh, and me and John were fine like that. I would never have gone like, if we, you know, we lift it, we lift it together. We lift the FA Cup together the, the days before and all that stuff, like, because, you know, that, that was never an issue. But I, the, I, what I remember about the game is the nervousness and awareness that we, we were the underdogs. Yeah. Probably feeling about what we may do in the evening when, when Robbie played the video to us of all our families. I think it was the evening before of all our kids and all our, you know, wives and girlfriends and mums and dads. And we had this surprise meeting where we thought it was going to be tactical. We went into the room yeah, yeah. and it was clips of, of you know, my wife. Yeah, that was special, that. That was, was really good. It was an incredible, it was a, it was an absolute uh, genius moment uh, that, that he, could, he could have basically thrown us out in any tactical shape after that. And that would have been the best thing he did because it made us all had a tear in our eye and have a kind of together moment. Mm -hmm. But so, but I, I did know going into the game how tough it would be and and I wanted to suck it up, but it's hard to suck at those things up. I look back now and I go, oh, that was the best night of my life. It only was when we lifted the trophy or when Didier scored the penalty. Before that was like the worst 120 minutes of my life. <laughs> it <laughs> was. Trying to like lick move with Gobin, yeah. trying to like stop, stop all the things that were going on in our own box. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I didn't, but I do remember the gesture before. I remember Didier stands out in my head because I remember Didier going into kind of like beast mode where he was like, Didier, <laughs> Didier had started to get this kind of routine where he would do this mad stuff against the wall when he'd do like yeah, yeah. exercises and yeah, then he'd, yeah, like, yeah. he'd look like this, yeah. you know, like, like he was a player. <laughs> and I remember looking at him and going, well, like, you know, I was a relatively quiet captain. I would influence people. Yeah. Uh, but Didier was like doing the thing. And I, I looked at Didier and went, yeah, I, I love that. that, that that's how, that's <laughs> you know, he'd Let's go with that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was, it was mad. And so, and we had like loads of, Kids bench with some young players. Like it was, it wasn't a team you expected to go out and win this game. So, the, the best night of my life, you know, in terms of in football, in terms by a mile, and uh, the, the proudest moment because we brought a, a group of players, and a lot of us have been there for a long time. Yeah, all those Chelsea fans behind the goal at that end or on that half, half of the pitch, and it was just amazing. And the, the only regret I have is that when we lifted the cup, that Jose Basinga, Basinga and someone else pushed me out of the way. So I went to lift it. <laughs> I, I kind of got, kind of got a tiny bit off balance and then I got shoved to the back. And I they pushed and I you on, didn't they? Like, you wanna, <laughs> again, I'm not a massive ego. I need to have that painted on my wall, but I do look yeah, at someone Yeah, yeah, that's true, that's true. I just got shoved over there. Yeah. <laughs> shoved back when we lift the cup. Because the I boys around me... Yeah, I wasn't even in the picture. When you look at that, I wasn't in the picture. I was right in the corner. But this, yeah. it's just like you said, I think, you know, I... I thought, you know, I, I probably had the best game of my my life or my Chelsea career. And I, I didn't think I needed to be in the picture because I yeah. knew what I did that night. And I knew what we did that night together as a team. Um, knowing that, you know, when the first goal went, when they scored, I remember looking at you because I turned around uh, when the goal went in. I turned around and I looked at you was like, come on. You were like, come on, come on. So that little positiveness that you had, and then when that corner happened and Drogba scored, I was like, you know, we're right back at it. You know, this is, this is us. We have to win now. This is us. We have to win this trophy right now. Because mm. obviously the likes of you, no disrespect, but your likes of you, uh, Drogba, Peter Che, JT, 
you, you guys were almost, you know, coming towards the end of the Chelsea career, didn't it? Yeah. So it has yeah. to happen then. And, 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 and I thought we had to do it that time. So, um, well, that it happened that time for me, it was yeah, Amazing. special. Amazing. Special. I, 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 sorry, I, I agree with that point. I'd be used to about being on the side, me joking about lifting the cup. But for me, those things are all about the memories. You know, I don't, you don't need, I don't need the picture. I don't need anything but the, the moment of us grafting away for 120 minutes in midfield. Like you, you were right. You had an amazing yeah. game. I played next to you in there and we were just grafting. It suited you more than me to do that role because you had that, yeah. that sort of yeah. Yeah. Way yeah. plan. I did yeah. it as well as I could. We tried to get out when we could, which was not much. Yeah. But like when you look back on those days, that's, it's just that, you know, I, I don't need um, med medals as such. I'm really proud of them but like that, that, that it's the memories of those nights that you just go that's exactly what you did it for exactly what you strive for when you're not in the team where you're training over the back of the pitch or you're doing your extra runs or you, whatever they, they all came together for us as a group yeah. night. It was just yeah. amazing. Amazing. you talked there Frank about it being your greatest night in football and 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 quite rightly so winning the European Cup after so many years and, and Chelsea's history in the European Cup Champions League as well I, I'll look at disappointments and failures you often talk about it's the failures that kind of build you and steal you to enjoy the successes your lowest moment in a Chelsea shirt Frank um, pr probably I mean losing the final in Moscow was a really low moment because of what you know what you've just spoken about you know that that's the best moment when you win it it's, it's almost the worst but that they all they all come together we had plenty of lows you know we had some I remember losing to Man United up at Old Trafford in the, I think it was a quarter final and Roman had come to the game beforehand and given us a bit of a heavy meeting as if to go you better win this game lads and we lost it and we lost it well you know like we were well beaten and I remember like losing game losing leagues when we should have won leagues so I think there were there were quite a lot of those moments. The the Moscow one is 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 certainly one that jumps out to me. But then you do you do have to kind of just push them to the side. That they come into your head now and again. But again, a little bit older now. I kind of look back and you try and reflect the good bits and you kind of go, well, you can't you can't have, you know, 13 years I was there where you win everything. And they're all part of the the story. If if I I weirdly believe if JT scores the pen or if, you know, Nico doesn't miss it and we manage to win that game, those those are all moments of fate that no one can control. But I, I believe that we might not win in Munich then. Do you know what I mean? Like no. it's, yeah. It's, yeah. The, story, the story is the story. Yep. Yep. Is what it yep. was. The year we won it, we were not the strongest. But yep. we won it because of all the toils and things before. We've had a lot of messages on our email address this past week. Uh, different people getting in touch with us wanting to know off the back of JT. Mm -hmm. If you get any more legends, you've got to ask this, you've got to ask that. You weren't part of this Chelsea team for this question, John, but I've got to get your thoughts, Frank. The ghost goal in 2005, the ghost goal, the semi-final against Liverpool, Luis Garcia, of course. Liverpool would get to Istanbul, the rest is history. Mm -hmm. Was it a goal, Frank, first and foremost? Oh, for me, for me it wasn't. And unfortunately, we didn't have the goal line technology then. So, like, you know, that could prove me wrong instantly. But the the fact that it was so so unclear to be over meant that it shouldn't be given. I, I think it got given because of the reaction of the crowd and the atmosphere in the stadium. So it may it may have been, you know, I'm not jumping it too far here because it may have been, but it was so close that without the technology that we now have, I don't see how you can give that important a goal in a game of that level. Um you know, there's no way the linesman or, or, or referee could have said, oh, no, it's clearly over the line. It wasn't. So for me, it wasn't a goal. Uh, and that was, and forgive me if I'm wrong, when I think of the Jose era, that was almost in a lot of respects, up until that point, the biggest disappointment of Jose's tenure. Can, and I'm going back a lot of years. What are we going back? 18 years. Do you remember the aftermath in the changing yeah. room? Was it one of anger, disappointment? Where was it? Pure disappointment. It was a year that we'd first year we won the league. Uh, we'd been flying that year, really. And we won the league at Bolton three or four days before the game. So we stayed up. So we beat Bolton on the Saturday, say. We played them on the Tuesday. Um, so we stayed up there. And looking back, probably not the best circumstances. We just won the league. It was almost like after we won the league, we met to the hotel, like, had one beer each, lads. We just won the league, but we got Liverpool in two, three days. So it wasn't ideal preparation. Um, and to be fair, when we went to Liverpool, like the atmosphere was rocking. You know, like they had it. For and it's a hard place to go. I'll be on, like, all yeah, sure. always, yeah, yeah. When it's yeah. flying with a crowd, yeah, you know, no matter what you try and do, they just bring an energy to their team that makes it really difficult for you. So, 
you know, we, we lost it. It was, it was, it was massive disappointment because we were on a way, we were feeling not invincible. It's, you know, you're not stupid to anybody can beat you in a level of game at Anfield like that. But it was a huge, huge disappointment. But you can't have everything. We'd won the league that year. Um, I, I think, I think we lost that game in the first leg. We drew nil nil at the bridge in the first game, and we had an averagey kind of performance. We didn't really do enough to get. It's in it's, it's in your hands these games. When you play at the bridge against Liverpool, the form we were in, you got to go one two three nil or something or whatever. You know, win the game. Yeah, you go there nil nil. Their crowd go here we go, and the ghost ghost goal did it for them. Oh nine's the other one. You were a member yeah. of that team. Uh, the six penalty shouts against Barcelona. Michael Eskin oh. scores early. Who I think is the boss? Semi-finals of the Champions League once again. Andreas Iniesta, 93rd minute. Equaliser, you go out and away goals. Yeah. Penalties galore. I actually watched highlights of this back. Out of the six legitimate claims, like you could make a real good case to no, say we should have yeah. had three. Yeah, we should have had two, about, two. about two or three, really, definitely. Remember that game from a John? I think, did you start on the bench? Yeah, I was on the bench. Yeah, I was on the bench. I remember Mike Lessing scoring the goal and uh, running up to me because I told him he was going to score before <laughs> the you? game. Yeah, I remember that. And he ran up to me to celebrate. But um, yeah, that was one of those games, isn't it? It was, it was up and down, wasn't it? It's like, you know, we were playing really well. We were creating lots of chances. And we had lots of chances where we should have been up. Um, obviously the referee at that time didn't, didn't really, he wasn't budging. He wasn't nope. really, yeah. So we had lots of penalties, lots of decisions would have gone our way, but he didn't do that. Um, and then obviously, um, Iniesta scored the goal, but, um, that was, you know, that was, that was, uh, the Champions League stage where I thought if we had gone through, really, I thought we had a really, really good team. I thought we could have won it. Um, yeah, absolutely. but obviously we didn't because of the decisions that didn't go our way that night. But, um, yeah, looking back at it, it was, it was really, really strange. Now, obviously Drogba had that moment after the game, didn't he, where he was. Oh, he lost it. Yeah, he it's, lost it, didn't it's he? It's a disgrace. It's yeah, a disgrace. Yeah, he lost it. It's he lost an it. Yeah, disgrace. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Was his exact words down the camera. And watching the highlights back to your point, with a better team, I yeah, felt. We were, we were. I mean, your we're. memories of it and looking back at it now, it, does it stink to high heaven that game? Yeah, it does. And fair play to Didier, by the way. Because I, I know people would say, like, don't sweat that. Like, you're, you're a, supposed to be a role model. But, like, I like people showing personality in those ways. It's how we all felt, you know. And and it was right. Because we, that was an amazing performance. That team at Barcelona, as it was for that period of time, over a good, a good few years, were, were brilliant. And but, but we had one over on them at the bridge, generally. And for some reason, at the bridge, it felt like a smaller pitch. You know, we could really get close and get. Yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And when we went to the new camp, like we would be like, you just get massive ninety minutes. <laughs> <laughs> didn't touch it. And I think we drew Popped the around. Yeah, did you play in the first leg, Obi. Did you play? In... Uh, yeah, I think I did. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because I, I remember get, I got subbed off of about fifteen to go, um, and um, we just hung on to a nil nil. Just got completely passed off the pitch. But we, by then, we we kind of had a feeling about us that we knew at the bridge we could just get amongst them and get close and sort of you know, be strong with them. And Smaller we did, pitch, very tight, yeah. yeah. Tight, get close to people. And I think the mid midfield was probably me, Michael, was it Essien and Bally? Essien, like, yeah, yeah, Bally, yeah. yeah, Bally, yeah. yeah, Bally, yeah. I mean, uh, looking at the team today, Anelka, Maluda, yeah. Ogba. And, and yeah. when, you think, when you think back, as you rightly point out, Frank, that Barca side that wiped the floor with the United in Rome in the final, mm -hmm. you would think to beat that Barca team, you'd have to shut up shop. But mm -hmm. Hoos was able to play Nicholas, Florent Malouda, yeah. and, and you had their measure. You really, really did in that game. Yeah, and we were we were big boys, you know, like we were we were a powerful team and we relied on that. It's one of the beauties of our generation of of being a big, strong team because you, you rely on that stuff. And, and we did. And that, that was huge respect to them. They were an amazing team. Um, I, I just felt when I went to, to Barcelona, I knew Iniesta could stand me up and take me anyway. I knew I'd try and press Xavi and he'd just back around the corner and get it back and play another yeah. one. But when I got him at the bridge, I thought I might be able to have a nibble at you. Yeah, and, yeah. And we all had a nibble that night. And we were, the, the, the penalties are stone, like, not say Stonewall, out of the, as you say, five or six, definitely two or three, you go, they're given. Yeah. And that there's, there was there was something in that that, that that didn't feel right at the time because they're so clear. Now we have VAR. There's no way we would have had two or three because VAR wouldn't be able to sit there and go, that's not a handball. I think Gerald Pico did the handball one. We just flicked it away. Yeah. And those things. So they, they would have been they would have been given and would have gone through all the night. 
And who knows if we beat Manchester United, but as Obi says, I think you'd have backed us because we were in a really good moment at that time. Um, and that that was our year. So when you, when we win at Munich, you do, that's one of the years you reflect back on and go, there was something taken away from us a bit there on that year. Yeah, that, in that dressing room, was that a feeling, boys, where you were looking at one another going, because uh, you boys, uh, you know, uh, I reference Andy Gray. You mentioned mm -hmm. him on yeah, the Taking yeah, yeah. the Mikel podcast yeah. the other day. Yeah. One of the big things from his analysis I always take away, and he's and yeah. he spot on here when he says, the players are the best indicator. You know, if there's going to be a penalty, look at the player's reaction. That's yeah. normally your first giveaway that it actually is a penalty. And seeing you boys that night, JT was pulling people away. DD8 to Frank's point, yeah, I'd lost, lost it. it. Yeah. Yeah, I lost and when it. you look at your body language, you know something. And don't get me wrong, I've seen players whinge and moan. Yeah. But there's something real about your reaction that night that tells you something just stunk to high heaven, you know? And, and sitting in that changing room, were you guys looking at one another going, ah, something is genuinely not right about this? No, no, I thought we, you know, we thought that that night was going to be our night. And we knew coming, if we was able to beat Barcelona, that's it. You know, we're probably going to win the uh, the, uh, the trophy, but we had to beat Barcelona, and and, and we had like like you said, Stonewall penalties. I remember you talking about the, the Gerard Pique ones, uh, the Abidal one as well, where where the ball just hit his hand. I think it was Michael Ballack who had the shot, and when yeah. he went to the to the referee, was going after him. You remember that? And yeah. the referee was not but He was like, no, no, it's no penalty. And um, no, that was yeah, yeah, that was it was one of them night where I was. You know, I was on the bench. I was, you know, I was watching. I was like, "This is this is something special here." Yeah. I'm watching something special here, and um, the effort that you guys put in. I mean, it was really special because obviously we we're on the bench sporting, but you could tell if you're on that pitch, the football that was played, the the passion. Uh, it, it, you know, it was so special. It was so moving. And to see Didier Drogba lose it that night, it was something, you know, you know him, you know, with his ego and everything. His <laughs> but um, obviously to see him lose it that night, it was something that, you know, yeah. I've, you know I've, I've never seen him lose it like that before. Yeah, that's, that's, I think that's top players. They have that edge. And I think he, he I, I respect that. You know, like at the moment, the next days he would have been told off or someone probably, I don't know if he got banned for it or whatever afterwards, but, but you know, if anyone should be banned, it should have been a referee after the game. Something, something <laughs> wasn't wrong. Right about that game. I, I want to move into your management career, Frank. I, I watched an interview you've given recently uh, and you talked about the second spell, the interim spell at Chelsea, the back end of last season. And you talked about the fact, huge squad, you felt when you walked in there, there were players whose heads were down, who already felt they were on their way out of the football club. And you talked about the importance of competition. You need competition to drive the ones who are starting and you need competition in, 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 in the hope that the boys who aren't getting in the team find a level to challenge. And, and it got me thinking, I just wonder, in all of your Chelsea career, who was the player that drove you? You talk about managers, but who's the signing? Who's the fellow midfielder, Frank, that you would look at and go, I've just got to up my level today because I want to make sure that I'm still one of the first names on the team sheet that I'm starting for Chelsea Football Club? Well, I, I had different phases of that. So I had the first time I got that feeling was when uh, Roman came in and they brought in uh, Makaleli. Um, and, and Maka wouldn't have been in my position as such, but he was a high-level midfield player that changed the face of it. And Veron. Veron came in and he was kind of, it was more offensive than me, I think. So, but I remember then kind of going, oh, like I didn't, I didn't want to get not budged out of the team. And I did. I remember sitting the first game in the Champions League um, group stage on the bench. It was me, JT and Ida Good Johnson. And we'd been a part of getting us in the Champions League the year before. So we sort of sat there and went, oh, is this all going to change now? So I think that was the first part of it. And part of being at Chelsea is about that. You know, like you, you have to have that feeling or you're not striving to improve all the time. The other one I probably remember is probably probably Balak coming in. Um, Michael Balak, I'd have had a couple of like games against him. I remember when we beat them in the Champions League quarterfinals or whatever, and I played against him. And I had a lot of respect for him in the game. And I remember actually Roman Abramovich and um, and Eugene Tenenbaum, he's a, he's a, not his assistant, but his work colleague at the time, um, spoke to me afterwards, like, what do you think about midfield players that we can bring in? And they were numerous names they mentioned. And I said, I really liked Ballack when I played against him. I thought he was powerful, quality, da, da, da. 
And then they brought him in. And when he brought when they brought him in, I was like, <laughs> <laughs> I don't want him to play in front of me. So I remember, I remember that moment. There you go, you idiot. I someone who's useless. I didn't like, mean for you guys to bring him in. <laughs> just yeah. give my view. I don't like this. <laughs> So I, I remember doing that, but I was, you know what, I was like that. Every, every, listen, we're all we're all human beings, you know. Like even like, you know, Obi would have felt the same. Like he was a, a young kid when he came to the club. Like maybe expected, not expected to play. Like you said before, like you wanted to play and thought it'd go differently. Like if you'd have come when I came a few years before, the team wasn't as good. You probably would have done, you know. But when I, you know, so like when I came in, I could get in the team and play forty five in my first year. I played average, really. But I stayed in the team. I learned a lot, da da da, and it carried on. When you came, we already had like Maka there. Yeah. So yeah, like Maka, yeah, yeah. Everyone's story is different, and that competition is just something you got to get over. But I certainly had a lot of moments through my career where anyone, I was protective like that. I was a very, you know, I, I wanted to be the best, and whether you know whether it was not not a selfishness, but it's like a a feeling in myself. I want to be the best. If someone's going to come in, it's good. It challenges you, you know, like, and, and I had that numerous times. It might have been with Obi. If, when we started playing a two in midfield, it might have been like, I want to be the one there, even though I'm not playing the 10, I want to be there. You know, like, it's a good thing. It's not should be the mentality of a club like Chelsea. Yeah. Is that when Super yeah. Frank st stopped talking to you? When you went to a two, he wouldn't talk to you. He was worried. <laughs> no, no, no. No, with Frank, I always know, like, listen, Frank is always... You know, he's always, he always wants to be, come Saturday afternoon, he wants to be in that pitch. It doesn't matter what, Frank wants to be in that pitch. And for, you know, for me, I I, I will say, looking back at those days, I, I clearly respect him for that because, you know, you have people coming from different places around the world and everybody wants to take a position. Yeah, of course. You have to, you have to, you have to stand up. You have to want to be the guy. And, 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 you know, fair play to you. You know, you you were there. You were always there. You were always the man. You were always the guy in the midfield. Okay, if you play three, so that's Frank. And who are the next two? Yeah. You know what I mean? So that's that's always been the case. Uh, and, 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 and you've always been the guy, you know, you, 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 you know, there's so many games, uh, games throughout the year whereby, you know, you've come up with big goals. You've, you know, we've won us the games and things like that. So, for me, I, I have huge, huge respect for you. Maybe I didn't say it enough when we were together, but I mean, looking back at what you what you did for the club and what you've made us achieve as a club and as a team, for me, you know, it's really, really special. Really, I can't say much. Can I yeah, ask? You know, sorry, can, I, can I just say that? I'll, I'll yeah. say the same to you because I was thinking earlier as well. I, I really appreciate that. And I'm the same. I, I maybe didn't say enough to you as, you know, like when you... Now I'm a coach and now I'm older and I've got children and all these things. You know, like when you come over as a young kid, there's a responsibility on the older players to give time and support to you as well. And then when you're in a competitive position sometimes, yeah, it's not yeah, simple. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? You didn't so, see that, did you? Yeah, 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 exactly. You, know, you don't see yeah, that, yeah. 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 And you get old and you realise it. And I'm, I've got the same respect sort of back to you that like, no matter, you know, like no matter who it was that came in, sometimes I want to be better than them. Sometimes, you know, you're not the part of their group in the dressing room or whatever and all those yeah, things. Right? Yeah. We, we found a made, way to make it work as a group, but you do live and learn through those things. Yeah. Can I ask a really personal question, Frank? I, I mean, given what you've gone through in the last few months with Chelsea, uh, a club you've admitted you know, as a boy, you were a West Ham fan, you grew to love Chelsea Football Club. I mean, my goodness, you've got two players in, in John Terry and John Obi saying that you're the greatest player that ever pulled on a blue shirt, for goodness sake. Has your relationship with the club been sullied at all with what's gone on in the last few months? No, not not at all. I think um, when you when you go into management, you understand that you, you your job's not going to be Chelsea manager for the rest of your life. I'm fortunate that I've done it once properly, second time in much more of a holding sort of babysitting role and what I feel is the club the club will never change because because the club is always about the fans and the people that support it and we've been very fortunate in the last 20 years because as Chelsea people you've been we've been used to the success it's sort of winning machine generally you know like we win a, we've won a lot of things in my time after my time we never really had a I wouldn't say we had a style like a Man City style or this sort of style. We were just a strong team that was a winning machine with some big players and good managers or whatever and a turnover of things. So the circumstance of me getting back there this time, I appreciated the opportunity to go. When I went in there, I probably expected let's say expected. I, I probably thought, can I impact some things here to help in this period and then it, you know, help the club, might help me. I'm back working, it's my club, all those things. 
when I went back there, I just realised that it was the most difficult moment I've ever um, experienced at the club because when even when I came pre-Roman, it was a club that was striving to get six. There was a humility to it. Now it's a club that wants more and hasn't got it at the moment. And the motivation levels that I saw there and the sort of like the 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 the, the work ethic and the desire wasn't there in that period. And I understood it because when I looked through the squad, I went through the squad and I'm like, and we've seen it now in this summer, I don't know, 15, 20 years have left. And one day we went on the ball when we were there and it was like halfway in my six weeks or seven weeks I was there and we looked through and it was like, we go, and we went through half the team, more than half the team, we're probably going to leave. Loans, leave, we, we knew kind of what was happening for the club's reasons or their own reasons. And you cannot play at a club like Chelsea. We keep talking here now about what a group we had, the players, you relied, we had a fight, we, uh, we supported each other, we drove each other. You cannot have a mentality in the modern day even more than ever because of the high level of the Premier League where it's not quite right. You cannot have players that are, that are thinking, I might be leaving here, so maybe this is not for me the last eight games because we're not going to win anything or whatever it is. I understood it on a personal level for the players. I didn't love all of it because it was never me. I didn't like it. But you can't, as a coach, you can't judge a player on how you would have felt. It's just, yeah. It just doesn't equate to think, oh, because everyone, everything's a different circumstance. But I understand a player that maybe hasn't played. And I came in at the back end of the season. So Thomas Tuchel had started the season. Season, you know, they'd lost a few games, they were doing okay, but they lost a few mm-hmm. games before everything. They left the club. Graham Potter came in and they, they went on a good run, and then they said difficult time and all those things. And I respected both those managers. So when I came in, I'm like, what's going on here? Like there's something happening, obviously. And when I understood then when I got that, I got the end of that. So a lot of players hadn't played disgruntled with the club, with the ex-manager, all these things. And we were playing in the running when I came in. I think we went to Wolves, who were fighting relegation. We went to Real Madrid, who were Real Madrid. We had Brian at home in the middle. Then we went to Real Madrid, came to us. Uh, I think then we played Brentford. Then we go to Arsenal, who were fighting for the league. And then our running at the end of the season was Man U, Man City, Newcastle. And all these teams are motivated and driven and like sort of like a version of what we're talking about with the things in football. Yeah. And they weren't there for the club in that period. So I, I had I had a big understanding coming out of it that you know I didn't I didn't learn a lot tactically. It wasn't a tactical period for me. There was nothing. If you haven't got motivation, that desire, things won't matter. If others have got more desire than you, so now I understood this. The early parts of this season, maybe the process going forward will be a bit of a challenge for the manager, for the team, for the club, for the fans, because they have to understand that this period is about trying to get back to some of the basics that we talked about in this era gone by. Let the players develop because they're going on a cool strategy of some younger players and I think once that happens I think hopefully then you start to see the benefits of it so I learned that to come back to the question did it did, did it I, I probably got a bit of stick from going back in that period because you lose games in the modern world social media love not to say loves it but you know like, <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> the, the reality the reality is I working within it have an understanding or as I see it of where the club was. And I, I don't think I had to tell too many people it. The, the important people at the club understand that. And the manager now will completely understand that. Unfortunately for him, that turnaround has probably given a, a different motivation to the group. You know, the players who wanted to leave or were thinking to leave, they've gone. And they've two gone, players, yeah. it will take them, put it together. And then you have to kind of stick with it and you'll have good and bad days. Like It's just normal now. Chelsea <laughs> want to get back to the stuff. I'm pretty sure they will. Yeah, it, it's candid from you, though. It's very, very candid, Frank, because you've said there when you walked in, I, I wonder, there's, it's two-pronged, this question. Do the ownership, did the ownership group know there was a motivation issue? And how many days did it take you and your coaching staff to say, we've got an uphill battle here because motivation, we might struggle to actually have an impact on this group because it's that low? Um, no, I, I think the ownership were aware. I can't talk for them, but I think they're aware because they've obviously, when you lose a manager, there's a reason for it. And when I'm coming in for 11 games, like I think there's an awareness that, you know, things are not great. So I suppose that was where my role was sort of hard to impact. And I think if you're an interim and we played under them, the managers come in in sort of like December or yeah. January, you, probably have a, you can have a run at it and you can affect, tactically affect people. In, in this, and we were challenging. It's like, can you win a Champions League? Can you get to the top four? Like now, it was like a middle ground of there's not much to play for. So, so it's normal. It's human nature. People think about themselves. Yeah. So I, the owners are not silly. They would have seen the difficult scenario of that. In terms of us as staff, we realised pretty quickly, particularly after we lost against Real Madrid and we got knocked out. We played pretty well at the bridge, but it didn't work for us. Blah blah blah. 
we, when we got knocked out, you could feel the building come down. And again, like then it becomes a, it was like, what, what, what's from our point of view, we're, we're not stupid at that point. We understand that it's going to be a tough run because there's not much to play for. For us, there was. For me, it, was a, it certainly wasn't my staff. But for certain players, it kind of they start thinking to the next thing. And I, we understood that. So it was like, what, what are the small wins that we can get, which might be a young player, it might be, you know, um, uh, Madawiki, or it might be, you know, given a chance to a certain player, what can you do and those things. So it was like that probably... That the, the challenges then were kind of like, can we try and win some games? Because this is Chelsea. You need to try and win games. And can you try and look at, like, you know, Mudrick? Can you get some games for him? Can you help him in positionally and what we want needs to do? And those things. So, you know, I, I didn't I didn't mind the time. You know, we, did, we didn't win enough games, clearly. But I, when I went into it, it was, I wasn't thinking we're going to flat the league. I had more realism than that. But when I got in there and I could see where the club was, because I'd experienced a lot of good times where the club was a driven club. At that moment... And as I say, I understand it a lot on individual levels. When you go through the squad, you kind of go, yeah, contract issue there, probably going to leave. Manager didn't play him, hasn't played for three months, out squad for most of the season. You kind yeah, of get it. Yeah, yeah. You, you yeah, get it yeah. on that level, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, John and I have spoken, and John speaks so highly of your IQ, Frank. You're a man that lives and breathes football. That's why you've moved into management. You know, the owners, did they say to you, was a conversation had that said, Frank, we're giving you 11 games here. If you pick up enough points, there is a chance that you stick your hand up and get this job long term. Or were you told from the word go, Frank, this is till the end of the season and then we'll say ta-ra? Yeah, I mean, it, was, it wasn't as clean cut as, as any of those. I, ne I never expected, having left Everton, um, to then come in and then kind of go, yeah, if you win five, six games, you'll be the next Chelsea manager. I didn't expect that. They didn't say that. Um, but I, uh, they also, you know, it, it was not, it was neither or, it was almost, let's look at this period and see what we can do with it. So there was never a, if you do this, well, you will stay at the club. So in my, in my head, it was, the period was what it was, absolutely. And it turned out to be the case. And you know what? I think that's probably better for, for everyone because in a sense, my challenge will be the next challenge. I think I've had my time there at Chelsea in this period where I've managed them before I came back there. You know, I think it's good that they get a fresh message in pre-season and a fresh idea. I think that's a good thing for the club. I think they need that. Um, so for me, I was I had a big understanding of the finite nature of what that would be. Yeah, listening to Frank there, John, you know, he's talking, he's talking honestly. Yeah. He's saying, listen, standards that you boys set, and it wasn't just you boys, there was a whole team behind that. Standards that Chelsea set, Frank saying there, those standards, for whatever reason, not there yet. When you watch Mauricio and, and Chelsea now, are you enthused by the direction or do you still see that there's a heck of a lot of work? That oh, there's a heck of a lot to be done, really. I mean, uh, there's mile, they, they, you know, they're miles away of it. I, I, I think the standard that we've set, <laughs> you know, when you, you know, when I, you know, we're talking about it the other day, um, I can understand, you know, they're going through a phase of trying to rebuild and trying to get, you know, the players to start playing together as a team and trying to get the players to start gelling as a team, obviously. There's so many young, talented players there at the club. Um, but how do we get them to start playing together as a team? How do we get them to start understanding each other? But when you look at them right now, every weekend when I watch them, it's like everybody's just playing for themselves. Nobody's playing for the club. Nobody's trying to fight for the club. But, you know, we've sat here, I've sat here, and I've defended the players. I've said, you know, they need time, they yeah. need time. Mauricio needs time. The players need time um, to 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 start to gel together and start to understand what Mauricio want them to do every time when they step on the pitch. But then nothing is happening. We you know we ten games or ten games into the season right games. now, but there's no there's, there's, you know there is no direction of what where and how we want to play. And then every weekend when we lose the game, you know, on a Monday, on a Sunday, you go down to, you know, social media, you look at the social media, Chelsea social media, you see them taking a picture, a group picture on the training ground, yeah. laughing, joking. We don't, we didn't do that, did we? That's something that was never going to happen during our time. You or JT or Mourinho probably say, what are you doing? We've lost the game. First of all, Mourinho doesn't, doesn't come down from his office <laughs> when he loses a game. You know, he stays in the office for like one or two days until we go out there and win again. Then he comes down. 
So those things, those are little things that never happened before. And it's happening now because when I look at it, you know, you've lost the game against Nottingham, uh, Nottingham Forest at home at Stamford Bridge 2-0. Yeah. And then you were on the next day as in the training ground taking pictures and smiling and joking. That never happened during our time. And I think the years have changed and there's a balance to it. I think now there's such, the, the way that football clubs have moved on and the business nature of it, that they absolutely need content um on social media etc and the players people want to get in the players lives now I, i can only speak personally i would have shunned it because i'd have been like if i was part of a performance i would have gone, i don't want any part of that luckily i didn't have to i would have told darren the photographer at the time like don't do me i'll stick my finger i've ruined the picture but like, i'll <laughs> stick my finger up and like, you can't use it anyway but yeah you do understand that the game's moved on to the point where there is there is a real desire for clubs to have to pump out things. And I, and I don't think that when you work a game, you understand also that to pump out on social media a load of negative faces on a Monday of players sitting there going, mm, but fans will go, well, that doesn't look great. Who's lifting them? Do you know what I mean? So, Or you can <laughs> yeah. maybe get them running and people go, well, at least they're running. They're like, it's, an, it's a bit of a no win. So I, I think the game's moved on to that point. But I, I do think when you come back to, to the Chelsea thing of the players and their reaction, I think what we, we we'd be amiss to say now about where how does him play and when we have spoken about when when Obi came and he was young and he wanted to play but he had to fight for his way or when I came at 22 I was nowhere near the player I was when I was 25 and then not look through that squad and go there's a 21 year old Ukrainian who has come over and now he's playing in the Premier League there's an Argentinian that's won the World Cup but he's coming over and he's settling his family and his young kids in the in the Premier League like all those stories so I think you have to kind of then kind of go okay in terms of strategy you kind of go whenever it was like Obi coming in Obi probably had time as much as he didn't want it at the time once he get in the team to learn from Maka to yeah. learn from yeah. yeah 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 those things you have a stability within the group and you kind of go here's Obi who's going to be a, a really good player for the next 10 years for this club and, but give him time or whatever and you'll see it you know or here's Sansa whoever it is so I think Chelsea now is a little bit of a of a of a perfect storm of kind of where they've gone okay well this is our strategy we're going to go young where's where's the, the stability in the group that when a young player kind of goes I don't know where to go here we can't break down this low block and we're getting counter-attacked who's the one that's going to go nah this is what we do but at the minute like they're lacking that kind of experienced spine so that's the strategy they've chosen so that that is there to be you know like looked at and questioned and kind of go what is that doing for us now? And I'm sure the strategy is that in two or three years, you'll see. But at this moment, the relative football is so hard hitting. If you've got some young players there, however good they may be, if yeah. they're struggling at the moment, it will be a tough time. They'll find themselves. Some will, some won't so much. But you know what I mean? I think that's what we're seeing with the team in a minute. And that's a difficult time. And the reason being is that Chelsea are used to winning. The fans are used to seeing a winning team and all those things. So, that's hard because the reaction is, well, we don't, we don't want to be 11th or 12th, you know? No, and no. We expect this. But for the yeah. players themselves within it, like that, they'll need some development and life development, not just football. It's like get settled in London. Find your way into the team. Mm -hmm. get, some, you know, get something about you. It's interesting you mentioned life development. And I wonder with this question, Frank, you know, did you learn much about yourself in that interim spell? If if you were to rewind and go back to the day you take the phone call and know what you're knowing now, would you have still said yes to the job? It's a, it's a difficult question. I, I think when it comes to Chelsea, I, I couldn't, I could never say no, I, I can, because it's my life. But when the, as the opportunity was there at the time in front of me, it was a chance to get to work again at a club that I love and try and have some positive impact, I'd say yeah again. And I'm quite thick skinned, so I don't I don't mind the whole fact that it could go this way, it could go that, that way. I'm, I'm ambitious, I want to do well, so I don't want things to be the de to the detriment of myself. But it, being my club, I, I couldn't see how I would say no. So I can't go back now and go, yeah, I would have said no if I'd have known that we might not win this many games. But at the, at the same time, when I got in there, did I learn much? Not really, in terms of when I talked about what I said before, if you're not fully motivated as a group and moving in the same direction. In this Premier League, it's not going to happen for you. And we've seen it with many teams. Chelsea not the only team. You know, we're talking now about Manchester United. We'd have looked at teams like Arsenal for the for the decade or so when they were not winning so much and not really changing at the top of the league. And it takes a turner of time sometimes to get everything aligned and go, okay, well, what's our real? What's our? What do we want to get to here? And what's our cup? What, what what style do we want to be? How do we? What sort of people do we want in the club? What kind of direction do we want to go? And I think Chelsea are finding that, but they're at the very early stages of doing that. So in terms of an experience, everything's an experience. Did I learn anything on a coaching level? No. 
because I don't think anything pretty much I'd have done. We tried different systems at different times. We had moments of playing quite well. But again, if you don't, if you lack that motivation, then this is is very hard. And, and fitness at the top level. Yeah, uh, we loved it last week. We we asked JT, really candid from JT. You know, I said to him, we asked the question, would you have wished that you got the call? You know, Frank got the call to help out the club. And JT said, I would have loved 100%. I would have loved the ownership for giving me a call. And, and he even said, I'd have loved a call from Frank. I would have helped out Frank. I look at your coaching staff. We've got Chris Jones over in this part of the world. Next few months, Jody Morris has been a part. Ashley Cole. Ashley Cole. Was there any part of you that would have considered JT as part of your coaching staff? Well, I've got the utmost respect for JT on every level. So in terms of the club going to John, that's not for me to answer. In terms of me, the club came to me. It happened very quickly. The first time they came to me, it's like I had probably about a day to say yes or no. I They wanted me to bring in two staff anyone who works in this game will know that when you are bringing in staff uh, as, a, as a coach a lot, of, a lot of it's a big question who are your staff how many do you want to bring they wanted me to bring in two staff now I'd just been at Chelsea before that and Derby and Chelsea and Everton working with my staff and you know I was going to bring it they wanted me to bring in two staff I ended up bringing in three because I needed Ashley Cobb doing set pieces for me at Everton and the people I've been working with were uh, Chris Jones as you mentioned Joe Edwards so it there was there was nowhere for me to go than that. And I spoke to John on the first day that I got to Joe. I got the utmost respect for John. If John went in and, and done that period or whatever, John, John John should be a manager of a football club right now because of what he's done in his career and how yeah, he's yeah. Uh, not just played, an ultimate player, you know, the best defender I think the Premier League's ever seen, but well, definitely is, in my opinion, but also how he managed, you know, people around him and the club yeah. and how he brought as a captain. That, that translates. doesn't mean he's going to be a great manager. doesn't mean I'm going to be a great Manager, there's so many variables to everything, so I think that should be John's story anyway. And when I went back to Chelsea at the time, I, I respect the people that I worked with for the last two or three years and worked closely with, um, and that's how I went back. And it was, a, it was, as I say, it was a small period. The first day I went in, back into work, John came over because it was at the academy. I think he went to Leicester two days later. So, but yeah, most I would happily work with John. John would be a great um, uh, influence on the players and all the things I've just spoken about are what Chelsea demands. Of course, John would be a great influence, but the reality is I was there for six weeks. The players now are going to have to understand what it means to Chelsea beyond me or John. It will be the manager and circumstances, how the next year goes to get to the levels. Like it's not for us to like my yeah. journey will go somewhere else now and John's will go somewhere else. Mm -hmm. your, your, your passion for the, the, the management game, if you will, is not dimmed by what you've gone through. You're still adamant. You're still an ambitious man, Frank. You want to be back in the dugout making a success of yourself. Yeah, I, I love doing it. And, and you say that when you have tough moments. I think in the, in the modern day, and um, the great Walt Smith who passed away, who I was relatively close to um, uh, at times, when I spoke to him when I first left Chelsea the first time, and Walter said to me, he said, Frank, you said, you've got to get it out of your mind about going in and five years or 10 years of football clubs now. He said, you know, it's not it's not the case. You know, you, you get a short span, go in and make the impact you can make. And, you know, you'll be successful, you won't be, and then move on to the next one. So I think having having successes, and I, and I sometimes from the outside, when I look at my, my managerial career at Derby, we got to a playoff final at Chelsea, we got to the Champions League. I left halfway through the, the next season just after and we were going well. We had a tough month. I left the club. At Everton, we stayed up. So I hold on to all the big successes. People don't want to talk about the successes yeah, necessarily. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I kind of go, yeah. And I love working with. Yeah, that was a big one, though. The Everton one. I mean, you managed yeah. to get them up. That was that was massive for me. That was big. That was really big. I mean, in, in, in that in that case, you know what? In terms of that, you know, everything in football is 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 a, is a lot to it. It's the tactical bit that we all see, and now everyone analyzes it on you know every sports program. It's like, what we should have moved him there. That yeah. was for a job into a club where everybody, pretty much everybody, pretty much, from staff to players, fans were like, we're going down. And the down yeah, yeah, that was yeah, more of a life. Yeah. Can you affect people to to breed positivity? And then can you get a, after that? Okay, can we get a system? We had to change from trying to play how we wanted to to be more defensive and a block and counter attack and all these things. I learned a million miles in four or five months of keeping ever in the league and the players keeping us in the league than I did probably before that because I had to change everything and we kept them up. So like those mm. things I hold on to and I enjoy working with players. I enjoy it. It's, it's, it's a tough job. You know, it's, it's people managing, it's working with young lads, it's trying to get into their own lives, trying to get the best out of them. But when you work, and I've been fortunate enough to work with some 
lads now who like the Reese James and the Mason Mounts and the Tammy Abrahams and all, all these people, you kind of go, I, I can message them now and, and, I, and I love them as lads because I've been part of their journey. They're, they're yeah. the talent. But you know what I mean? Yeah. You did that. Yeah. Oh, I love that part of it. So yeah. I want to get back to doing that. And I'm enjoying time now at the minute. I've got my family. I'm managing to see my children much more without thinking about training tomorrow. Who are we going to bring in the window? <laughs> yeah. What's my, when's my owner going to give me a call on the phone for an hour? Like those things come with a job. Yeah. Now I'm enjoying it, but I'm very, I'm very, let's say hungry to get back. I'm looking forward to getting back, but I will certainly want to find what I feel like is the right thing for me. Um, and that I don't want to sound too picky when I say that, but I worked at Chelsea in this moment. It was a tough moment going back there. And Everton, everyone understands Everton, I think, in the last few years has been a tough club um, for different reasons to work at. Great, you know, great managers before me have, have had tough moments there. I would like to go to someone who can really get my teeth into working and feel like it's going in the direction I want it to go. Yeah, that was yeah. going to be my question. Yeah, actually. yeah, I was going to say that. Are you looking now? Obviously, you're looking at it. Are you thinking... Does he have to be here? Does he have to be here? In the, does he have to be in the UK? Or you're looking at more of, you know, it doesn't matter where abroad. Obviously, we're talking now. You know, Steven Gerrard is in Saudi Arabia. Is it something, something you're looking at? Or are you, are you? Does he has to be somewhere in the Premier League or you know in the UK? No, it, it doesn't for me. I mean, it's like um, I love the Premier League. We've got the best league in the world, so I'd, I'd love to work here again. But at the same time, I'm all about experiences and wanting to coach and work with players, life experiences. Now, I went to New York as a player, and little did I know, but as a life experience, it'd be the best thing I ever did at 37 years of age. So on a coaching note, to go and work in Europe, further afield, to go to different parts of the world and work with players, test yourself, challenge yourself, speak another language, learn more about culture. I think it's all a plus. And I'm fortunate because of probably the playing career I had that I'm comfortable enough that I can kind of go, yeah, I want to wait for the right thing. I mean, you know, I'm I'm lucky there. I think being an ex-player and managing, sometimes people can kind of throw a blanket over you and go, oh, you know, but he played, that's why he got yeah, his job. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm a worker. I like to work. It doesn't matter where, I, where I'm going to go. And as long as I know my family will be happy because I have to make sure of that. Yeah. I'll, I'll be very happy to, to, you know, to put another string to my bow because as well, I... I, I was with the night. So we talk about the Champions League winning the Champions League. Were it was a great night, um, the best night, as I said before. But working at Derby and beating Leeds in the playoff semi final, uh, and, and sort of like meeting the people at Derby and seeing what it meant to different people and a different type of foot, you know, like the people who work behind the scenes at the training ground, were like amazing experiences. And going to Everton and seeing what it meant to the people there, you don't have to win the Champions League to be a successful person yeah. in sport. Yeah. You'll yeah. fail much more than you'll succeed. But succeeding at Everton was staying up. Or getting to the playoff final was like a like the last step from succeeding at Derby. Yeah. But in the middle was lovely. You know, I, I'm not hanging on to give me a job because I want to go and win the Champions League. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm mm -hmm. really I want to go and work mm -hmm. in a good environment and make sure my family are happy. Simple yeah, yeah it's, it, it's great there, Frank. And, and listen, final few, you've been topped with us this evening for the time that you've given us. I, I would love to know, you've said they're the right environment. You know, what does Frank Lampard need to succeed at a football club? That would be the question I'd ask you. You know, you've said there you'll be maybe a bit more picky. What are maybe the first couple of questions you'd ask a CEO or a chairman that perhaps you wouldn't have, say, a year or two years ago? Well, I think sometimes in life, um, and maybe I'm fortunate because of my career and stuff, but sometimes it's easy to the idea to say, yes, oh, yeah, I'll take that. That's another job I want to get working. Sometimes I think you've got to say no if it doesn't feel right. So at the moment, I come, as I say, I don't want to sound like I'm being like, I'm going to say no to everybody because I want to work. Mm -hmm. And every job you go into, there's there's a reason you're going into it generally. It's like probably someone's got the sack is, is most of the time or they've done really well and they've moved on to better things so you better do well. You know, so there's always like a bit of a question mark going in. I think it's just to be like aligned in what your thinking is. You know, like, uh, you know, like if you go to a, and this is what I found about Everton, there was an amazing passion about Everton. Like the the community, the fans, like it's something incredible. I never thought I'd go and live in Liverpool and work with people there, and that was amazing. But in the in a football sense, I felt in the second year I was there, the way I, I you know I kind of wanted to take it football wise it didn't quite align for different reasons. And I won't go into the millions of politics, but if you do need to try and be aligned and have a good communication with the people that are above you, the ownership, the sporting director, yourself. And know that if you want to take it forward, you can bring in players that go with the way. Because otherwise, you're fighting against it a little bit. You know what I mean? Like that that mm -hmm. will be a challenge. So you, you never know. And as I say, I don't want to sound too particular. 
about it. But if I feel like something's right for me, I, I'll travel, I will go here, I'll go there, as long as the family are right and and uh, and give my best because I do like working. I, we, we were lucky as players. We had the best job in the world. We rolled yeah. into work up nine, you know, busy hour, go make us a cup of tea or <laughs> Jay, busy you know, like whatever. <laughs> and then, and then we, you know, we'll be home at two. We wanted to get yeah. back down the eight. When you, when you become a manager, you step back at 40 years of age into real life. You're up at six, you get in first, you do all the work. You get home at six. You still work in the evening, yeah. so yeah. I I don't mind that side of it. For some weird reason, I'm I'm affected by that in a good way that I like it. So, you know, he's just he's but, just explained there, John, why you've not moved into management, yeah, working exactly. fifteen hour days, <laughs> no chance. Nah. you do a podcast for ninety not. minutes. <laughs> You're the smart one, Obi. Don't worry. Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely not. No, credit to you guys. I mean, you, you, I mean, uh, you know, I mean, uh, people are always ask me, uh, why do you think Frank is the guy who's, um, you know, who's gone into management and who's who's done well in terms of when it comes to management? And and we've always thought JT is the guy. We thought JT was the guy who's probably going to be the guy after you guys finish playing, who's going to be the guy who's gone into management. And my answer was, you know, they both are very different. You know, JT yeah. was a vocal guy. JT was always, the, 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 you know, he's, you know, his voice is always, you know, he's loudest, you know, he speaks, you know, he screams, he shouts, he holds you by the neck, he does. But Frank was the guy who, you know, if he was a captain, you know, he's a vice captain, you know, he's more calm, he's more chill. You know, he, he, you know, Frank is the guy who, who, who passes his measures on the page. You know, look at me what I'm doing on the page. Follow what I do on the page. Yeah. And then there's performances, you know, the performances, the standard that he set on the page, that's what we follow. And, um, and, 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 and I will, I've always said you, you, you weren't that guy who has the, the, the biggest banter, you know. You come in the dressing room sometimes or in the treatment room, you have a little bit of banter with Billy, a busy hour, like you just said, a little bit of banter. And then, you know, that's it. You know, that's it. You're gone. You're done. Uh, but that's just who you are. You know, uh, people are different. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I don't, I, I don't miss the dressing room. I don't miss playing. I don't miss it. Like some people like crave. I probably got to 30, but I 38 when I finished. And I was happy to finish pretty much because I felt like I'd left it all. I was like, my body was telling me younger boys were running around me. My calf was <laughs> putting my calf every other month. So I don't, I don't miss that. And I was never, like you say, I was never massively as a player about dressing room. I was kind of like so focused on my own game yeah, and, yeah. and all those things that, I, I, you know, maybe, you know, that's just how I was. Viewing that from the outside, you, you've just sort of said it. But I do I do think when it comes to management, I don't think you can dict you can guess what, as a player will, will translate into manager because everyone will be different. Like, you know, JT yeah. was, JT will be his own version of himself if he wants to coach mm -hmm. and, and he'll succeed. I'm pretty sure he would succeed if given the right opportunity in the right circumstances. And I do it my way, but I was always kind of a bit of a thinker. I didn't want to manage until I was probably about 30. When I got to 30, I started looking around going, yeah, maybe I would like to do it. So I think everyone, you know, like it's, you, but the, the reality is when you pack up playing, if you want to coach, you've got to do your badges, you've got to work, you've got to study, you've got to get better at things that you're not good at, you've got to deal with people, you've got people around you that are better than you at things that you're not great at, you've got to manage them. And managing people from running around for 90 minutes on the pitch is like chalk and cheese. You have mm. to get that part of the job as well as you can. And that's that's obviously a challenge. And I'm not just talking about football. I think you can talk mm. about anything in life. So I think as, as, a, as a player, you definitely have to reboot the minute you pack up and go, do I want to do this or not? Some players do podcasts like you're doing and do business. <laughs> and do, you, know, but you know, like, you choose yeah. it, but that, that's absolutely right. You know yeah, what I mean? Course, like, yeah. you choose what makes yeah. you happy, your family yeah. happy. And, yeah. and you know, for me, I enjoy doing what I'm doing. So that's just, you know, where I'm at, you know, and I want to succeed. And you'll be so driven about wanting to make this best podcast you can make. Yeah, it. yeah, yeah. I want to be the best coach I can be yeah. and make sure my family are right. End of story. Well, it certainly helps when we've got Frank Lampard as guest number two in the podcast. You just need to find some Frank Lampards on the pitch for you, Frank. Uh, listen, <laughs> last couple. Uh, it would be remiss of us not to ask, given where we are doing this podcast from the United Arab Emirates, I often think it gets forgotten a little bit that part of your story is Manchester City. You know, you went there at 2014. With Khaldun Mubarak there, Sheikh Mansour there, Pep had yet to get there. Ferran Soriano had yet 
to get there, or maybe he was at that point. Maybe Ferran was there. He came in, he came in and went to New York. Yeah. Okay, so he was there, and, and Ferran is one of the top boys that I've had the pleasure of interacting with. He is as good of an executive as there is in world football. He really is. He understands the game. Right. You know, your, your experience there, and be honest, and it's a bit of a kind of, I guess you could shirk this if you wanted to, but did you get a sense, Frank, in, Frank, in that football club, Jesus, this this club are headed somewhere. This club is going to be a monster in a few years' time. Absolutely, absolutely. It's the when I left Chelsea, I didn't I didn't want to leave. I was told to leave. I got let go. Uh, which at the time, really? was, yeah, yeah, it was it was at the end of the season, and I think we played our last home game. I got told midweek that I was not going to get a new contract. My contract was up. So the timing wasn't great, but I don't look back on it. It is what it is now. I understand it a tiny bit. And as I've got older, like, yeah, they were probably holding out for some reason. I think I probably should have been told earlier. Anyway, uh, I didn't want to leave. When the opportunity went to, came to go to New York, I thought that was a great life experience. I liked the idea of that. And then Man City came along. And my year I spent there as a player at Man City, the 18 months I spent in New York, opened up my eyes to a completely different world of, you know, like I've been so conformed to the Chelsea way and I loved it. But to be honest, after 13 years, you probably get used to the same stuff. Do you know what I mean? Like I think probably working in that period of time anywhere is is challenging. When I went to Man City and you work with people like Ferran and Cheeky and Cal Doon and the vision and this kind of vision, of, this is the way we're going to go. I saw, as you say, the sort of springs of it at the beginning of it. And I was like, this is serious. We moved into the new training ground the year that I was there. And you could just see, already it was a great team. They'd won the, the Premier League the year before, but it was changing. And obviously Pep came after me. And I went when I went to New York, it was it was the same. The, the group were just supportive and driven and communicate. And there's a bigger picture than re reacting to this result or whatever. They have a style and an idea that they want to follow. Uh, uh, honestly, like the, the warmth of the people, I'm still in touch with a lot of people there now. And I'm just pleased that I had that period in my life at the end because I could have just finished at Chelsea or could have gone somewhere else but I went and worked at one of the best groups um, in the world at that at that period and um, yeah really eye-opening for me and probably pushed me on in the idea of trying to manage I remember sitting with Brian in New York um, having breakfast one day and he was talking about do you want to manage and I was like yeah I do but I don't you know and, and he gave me the most amazing advice and spoke about Pep and um, yeah big things that stuck with me. City or some team, we've talked about it, John. Yeah, They're yeah. the standard beater. It's as simple as that. They are. You know, if you boys were the standard beaters mm. in the Premier League and you were at Chelsea, it's now Man City. They're the ones to be. It is, of, of course, it is Man City. But oh, I, I think when you look at the Man City now, I mean, looking at back at a team that we had back in the day, I remember Frank just saying earlier on, um, um, uh, the physicality of <laughs> us, the power that we had, uh, but that's something that you need to weigh in and say, okay, if we played against this, this city team right now, who's gonna, you know, who's gonna come out on top? But I think looking back at us then, when we, uh, the thing is when we are already on the tunnel, you know, you're already beaten. When you look at the team, when you look at the, the height, the power, the physicality that we had, you know, the names that we had, then you know, okay, you're going into a battle here, you're gonna get beaten. Yeah. And and and, and that's what we had, you know, we were specimen, we we're powerful, we're big, we're strong. Um, but you no, know, but this city team, they've set a standard. I mean, they're the best team in the world right now, no yeah. doubt about it. Yeah. Would you have beaten them, Frank? Would you have fancied taking on Pepe City? You know what? I, I think I think I agree with what Obi said about our physicality and our qualities as well. We have match winners and strength within the group, but they're also big now. Like that's the that's the, the impressive thing about City. As they've evolved through the teams, I think Pep's probably had two yeah, or three. Yeah. They're like they're playing, you know, centre halves at left back, Carl Walker's a right back. If John Stones can step into midfield. John Stones, yeah. Rod, Rod, Rodri's six foot two and in midfield. Harlan's up front. Like yeah. they're now a physical and athletic team as well as tactically and you know, technically an amazing team. So I, I think, you know, it's it's a hard one. Deciding who would win across areas is difficult. Tactically, the game's moved on so much that they would ask us a lot more questions than what we would have got asked in our mm, play yeah. from most teams. Maybe Barcelona or those teams that, and Bayern Munich, we played against Pep's teams. But then I think it's evolved again where now in, on a coaching level where we would have been asked the questions. We would need time. Like, don't get me wrong, the group we had and 
if we were living in the modern day, getting asked the questions. To yeah, improve. yeah, that's and the thing. We, yeah. we would have reacted yeah, to we, it. We, yeah, exactly. We can adjust to that. Yeah, adapt. Yeah, yeah adapt. I'm, I'm sure yeah. you would. Yeah. Yeah. Right, last couple, and I promise I'll let you get off, Frank. It's been great to have you on episode two of the uh, the OB1 podcast, made possible by Betwinner, of course. And it's a, a question that John told us this little tale about you, and I've, I'm, I'm fascinated by it. He told us that, you know, everyone's larking around, some guys were on Football Manager after a game. Apparently, you love a crossword. Do you still love a crossword? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know what? We've, we've two, I've got a five-year-old and a two-year-old. So if you think I've got like, like 20 <laughs> of my day, sitting on a crossword... Uh, it'd be absolutely zero. <laughs> no, I, I, you know, no, it's it's not. I I do I do like my I, I do I know I like to read a little bit. Um, yeah, not as I'd want to read. I'd like my little moments. I'm not this. You know, I I did an IQ test once and I came out high. I've never wanted to do one again because I'm worried that the reality will say that was, <laughs> that, that was the wrong result. And really, I'm down here. Yeah, but I do know. I, I probably I was a little not. Not different like that. I used to love getting involved with the lads, but I was a little bit more kind of um, not reserved, but like a, a potential crossword. I've never, I've not seen a crossword in years. Is my okay, answer. Uh, and that's not a myth. Your <laughs> IQ is higher than Albert Einstein's. Is that true? My, uh, I don't, I don't know if it's higher than Einstein's. Um, no, I'm, I'm guessing it's not. It can't be. <laughs> no, no. But, no it, it was, it was high. It was high. Yeah, yeah. It was, it was right. one of those days. When I've been out of training with my wet top on, sweating out the night before, and then I did the IQ test, and I nailed it. No, but I definitely say, I mean, he was, uh, he, I mean, I don't know about the other guys, though, but for me, I definitely, I will definitely say, you know, you were probably the smartest, uh, you are the smartest, you were probably the smartest player that we had back then. Um, and and, 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 and obviously... <laughs> no, 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 but you were. I mean, I know you love reading. I, I think you came out with a book, didn't you? When you were still playing, was it kids' book or something like that? You yeah, came out with it. exactly. So, I, you know, looking back at that and thinking about that as well. So that's why you know I, I, I can come up with this, with this stuff. And um, you know, when it comes also with you know dress sense, Frank was always you know smart. yeah smart, always looking proper uh, when it comes. You know, we always used to hang dresses of players who dress was my dresses would be my my tops or my shorts have always been there. But I mean, you've never had anything hang up there, have you? No, no, you're not touching Frank's I think I did No, I you think did I did once. once. I think I did once and I had to wear it and I kind of like quietly sort of, I remember JT something of JT going up once. And when Jake when something from JT went up, he literally dragged it down. <laughs> JT used to run that dressing room. It was funny. We had a yeah, good dressing room, didn't we? Yeah, there was yeah. some, some uh, moments, listen, last, yeah. last one from me, Frank. You've got to settle the debate that fans up and down the UK have, fans around the world have, and it's a bit of fun. We all know who's top. Lampard, Gerrard, Scholes. It's the debate that all fans have. You know what I get? It's a debate that I get when I get in a cab in London. And <laughs> you only get like a cheeky cab who wants to talk too much. <laughs> What do you think? Do you think you're better? <laughs> no, okay, it was fun. And uh, now, listen, I, I'm, I'm going to so, so sit on the fence here. It's, it's not, it's not a, a uh, it's not a debate that, that's worthy of anything. You know what I mean? I, I played with, uh, with and against both with England. They were incredible players. We had different attributes, um, and we were in different circumstances. Do you know what I mean? And you know, so I, I don't. I've got the utmost respect for those players, and I'd hate to. Like, I, I, the good, the good thing in you pack up. I don't, I don't think you have to sort of like. If someone went to me, Frank, you know what? Here's the debate, and I think Stevie's better than you. I go, yeah. well, he was amazing. Like, I agree with you. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, it's, it's no big deal. So I'm pleased to be in a debate at that level with players. I know what my strengths were. I know what I did. I respect what they did, um, and I, and I think it's a useless debate. Speaking as a Scotsman, and, I, and I'm glad that England didn't cotton on to this, but, you know, with the way the game's evolved, I guess the biggest travesty, and you're right with that debate, that's one for the fans. I guess in a lot of ways, though, Frank, the biggest travesty is the three of you didn't play more often. Scolzi retired yeah. relatively young. Yeah. When you think yeah. of the way the game's evolved now, and certainly the way Scolzi evolved as a player, he'd be the deep lion one. He'd be the one, deep one, yeah. yeah Straight yeah. all over. Yeah. Like yeah. Gerard box to box, and, and Frank, you box to yeah. box. Yeah. You know, as a Scotsman, I'm glad that England didn't have the wherewithal to, to find that kind of system. But is that a bit of a regret from an England perspective? 
Well, you know what the the issue was, and I, and I, I don't remember the timeline exactly of it, but I, I broke into the team in two thousand four in the in the Euros in Portugal. Stevie had broken in before me. Scalzi was well established by then. There was a problem getting us all in the same team in that tournament, so it ended up. Uh, I think we did we play a diamond, and anyway, whatever way it was, it felt shoe. And then Scalzi kind of went on the side. And at that point, then Scalzi retired from, from English football, which was a big miss because I think it was like 30, 31. But I think he had his own reasons. I think some might have been maybe tactical. You'd have to ask him. I think some were maybe family or whatever. Um, and it's a shame because without a doubt, then Scalzi was just evolving into this deep line player at Man United where he was amazing. You know, I played against him when he was young and he'd get in the box and score goals against you and run beyond you. And then he sat back and you couldn't get near him because he just controlled the game. Things in, yeah. And, yeah, and, and it was one of those that, you know, I think if Scalzi had stayed in the game, I think that might have found itself a little bit. Um, and we never found it because we were always playing two in midfield and it didn't kind of work. And I think there's probably like, it's a, it's a multi thing where you kind of go, could we have found a better system? Scalzi had his choice. That's his prerogative. Could I play better at times for England? Absolutely. It's much more comfortable with Chelsea at times. I wish I'd done more for my country. That's me saying that. Um, but as a player, you, you will be, because it's such a, High level only as good as like the structure and the system that you're coming into. If it doesn't quite work, like you're not going to get the best out of yourself. And England mm -hmm. was, such a, was such a cutting environment at the time in terms of the outside that if we didn't go and beat a certain team in the go to the World Cup and not beat, you know, I remember drawing with Albania nil nil, you know, and, and every oh, sorry, it wasn't Albania, it was like it was, a, it, was an, it was an African team. I can't remember what it was. Sorry, apologies, but it was like 2010, the second game, Algeria, and we drew Algeria, nil nil. Okay. Yeah, Algeria, and we drew nil nil, and we played poorly, and we got absolutely hammered. And that comes with playing for England. So at that at that time, it was different. There's a much more positive vibe around the, the national team, but lots of things just fall into place. But you know what? As well, people talk about the golden era. Spain also had a golden era. Yeah. So did Germany, and so mm -hmm. did the other. It's the World mm -hmm. Cup every four year, and the Euros the other two years. Like we we had no right to win it. I don't have any regrets. I've got hundred odd caps and. You know, it's a shame, but, you know, when you pack up, I think the last thing you want to do is too many regrets about things. So, Oh, but I'm sure, like all Englishmen, Frank, you're licking your chops at a certain Jude Bellingham. There's a truly generational, we spoke about him, John, didn't we? Mm -hmm. I mean, that boy is pretty special at 20, isn't he? The, the boy is incredible. I mean, to go and do what he's done uh, in, in Madrid, with what the pressure that comes in, in, a, in a club that big, in a city that big, where the, the all eyes are on at his age, and do what he did at Dortmund before. I, when I was yeah. at Chelsea, I went to bring him to Chelsea when I was managing there the first time. I was desperate to bring him. Um, Jim Fraser, who's the academy. Really? Yeah, wow. Jim, Jim okay. Fraser was like, Jim Fraser is you know, an amazing academy. He was like, this boy, and you know, kept bringing him. And I was like, wow, I was overwhelmed looking at this kid. He was 16, 17 at the time. I wanted to bring him and it, 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 I couldn't get it through upstairs. It, it, they couldn't, um, the idea of paying 20 million plus for him at his age. Um, but what he's done from there himself, the stature of him, his manner, how he how he is, how he plays, how he's handled it. I think, the, you know, the, the world's his oyster. He's like, you know, where, where's the ceiling for him? And the minute you can't see it because yeah, it's, yeah, it's yeah. Still going. amazing player. It's a, it's a credit to, to, it, to him and his family because I met his mum and dad very grounded, um, going to be a huge player. He can do what he wants. And if England are going to have success over the next years, which I think they probably can do, he's going to be absolutely central to it. Oh, if player. only they'd listen to you, Frank. You said in a previous interview, Declan was someone you wanted to make captain and Jude Bellingham. If they just listened to you, they could have yeah. had a midfield of Declan Rice and Jude Bellingham. Some football's full of those, you know what I mean? Oh. Like, you know, <laughs> I, I wish it wasn't, uh, it wasn't to be at the time, but you know, like a, yeah, as a as a manager, sometimes you will only be good as your recruitment as well, and getting those things over the line because the players, the players are always the most important thing. You know, it's it's, it's, it's a fact. You know, like the, yeah. the rest to come into place of the players. And Jude Bellingham is a as an absolute high level player. So, um, yeah. Well, listen, great way to end it. He's the future, of course, Frank. You're the past from a playing career perspective. We're not going to have to wait too long to see you back in the dugout. The message is, you're available. You're excited for the next challenge and we'll see you back in management before too long. We'll, we'll see. You know, my, my son won't be happy because he won't have dad kicking the ball <laughs> in the room with him. So I'll have to make sure I clear it with the kids. But no, I, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm ready. I mean, I'm in, I mean, as I said, I'm enjoying my time, um, but I do want to work again because, you know, that's what it is. So we'll see.
Right, uh, last one. Embarrass John Obi. Your best John Obi Mikel oh story. Oh my God. I've got to ask I don't think he's got one. We've waited an hour and a half for I this. I don't think he's got one. Frankie boy, come on. <laughs> your best John Obi story. Uh, no, I've, I've not. I've, I've, the only one I can... <laughs> no, it's not like it. No, but this, this is going to sound like I'm gloating. But I remember, I remember do you remember the one-on-ones in Dallas? Where, where's that? In Dallas, we were in pre-season and yeah. we're in Dallas and we have one-on-ones um, as in like you go one against one. Yeah, 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 yeah. Together. And it was like about 35 degrees. <laughs> so, right, it was absolutely right. I don't know, had you been injured? I, I've been injured. I'd had, I was coming back from something and me and you were going one-on-ones and I remember... <laughs> I had you off that day, Obi, and I remember because it was roasting hot. And you were struggling, and I was loving it. I was loving it. That was my little Nick. You know, like that kind of. Yeah, Nick there you go. I think, I think we've been given a night. I think we might have been given a down night the night before. Yeah, I probably all- was out. I probably was out. I came back from at five a.m. in the morning, probably something I, like that. I was out too. <laughs> I love it. No, he was, you know what? Obi, Obi, was, Obi was a dream to work with. It was an absolute dream. My like, fucking big funnies. Like we, we weren't like that, were we? Really? Like we, the dressing room was all happening, and it was. Yeah, uh, it was. Yeah, the, it the, was. The I mean, from, yeah. The story to me is the fact that we suffered for 120 minutes in Munich. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Produced a game of your life, and you know what I mean. I couldn't have done that without you next to me because I was 33 and I was chasing <laughs> that night. So it was, uh, I, 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 I noticed the difference as well, Frank. You're obviously remodeling the house at the minute. JT last week had his trophies and his medals. Where are they in the Frank Lampard house, or are they in uh, a safe somewhere? Yeah, they're they're out of the way. As I said before, I don't really. Uh, I'm not a massive one to to have to. Uh, too much out. I don't, um, and each to their own. Do you know what I mean? But I, I've got a couple of bits that I are out because it's nice sometimes the kids because they, they have no understanding. My younger children, but the rest of them are out. I, I, I actually found a uh, FA Cup winning medal. Uh, was it a Premier League winning medal? I can't remember. We won so much, but I actually found one in a shoe. <laughs> I was like, I'm gonna clear out in the wall guy, but it was obviously in my black shoe. It was in my black smart shoe that, that I clearly worn with my suit. You know, like when you go straight out after in your suit. Yeah. You're like, yeah. and I've forgotten about it you <laughs> stuck in there I got the shoe and I'll tie it and I was like there's something in the bottom and I rolled it down and it was the FA Cup winning medal <laughs> that's how much I do care but I care that's about that's how much medal. you care about it <laughs> I know I, obviously it's really safe now yeah like, but I, I'd obviously come home on one of those nights and gone I could stick it in the shoe <laughs> So, yeah. Oh, amazing, amazing. And, and the sweat jacket, <laughs> does it get rolled out every now and again, Frank? Yeah, I've got, I, I bought something on, <laughs> I, bought, <laughs> I bought something online the other day, I've got like sweat things, because in my own weird mind, I think that if I do 40 m- minutes on the bike, the sweat yeah. thing make me like, you know, keep yeah. more in trim. Yeah. So, like, it, Frank. It, that's a lifer. I've got that for life, for sure. <laughs> It's been an absolute treat and I sincerely hope and I, and I know whether it's Chelsea fans, City fans, England fans, football fans, that's a real treat and, and we thank you genuinely because you've spared an evening to chat to us. Yeah, I don't yeah. think there's a question and a topic we didn't cover over the course of the last 90 minutes. Thank you so much, Frank. You're a top man and we wish you well, not only in management, personal life as well. You're a father of four beautiful kids. Uh, enjoy, be safe. And uh, yeah, make sure to tune in to the Obi-Wan podcast moving forward. I will do. I will do. Absolutely. When I'm walking the dog, I'll be listening to you. Don't worry about that. <laughs> no more old stories, Obi. No more stories about me. <laughs> Thank you, old boy. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Thank you, Thank you, Frank. Thank you so much. Good luck okay? Cheers. Top Thanks, stuff. old boy. Cheers. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Frank Lampard, episode two yeah. of the Obi-Wan Amazing. podcast made possible by Bet Winner. What a gentleman he is. Winning has always been my driving force. Growing up, I dreamt of playing for the Nigerian national team. My passion led me there. The support and unity of players and Nigerian fans led us to the final. Together, we won the African Cup of Nations. The moment that will forever be carved in my heart. Join the winning team with Betwinner.